powered from the Perdomo Cigar Studios on the Black Stage in Indian Trail, North Carolina, and broadcasting from the Drew Estate Studios in California. It's episode 156 of the Primetime Show. Tonight, we welcome Santana Diaz of Pure Roma Cigars to the Primetime Show. And as always, the Primetime Show is sponsored by Saga Cigars. De Los Reyes Cigars introduces another chapter of the saga, the Saga Celez. Celez is a Spanish word that means leisure after work. In the spirit of the standing ideal of owning your own journey and making your own saga, the Saga Celez is the perfect companion to enrich those moments of choice, making them truly yours. Saga Celez carries a blend of Criollo Olor and Peloto Cubano wrapped in a selected Ecuador shade Claro wrapper that generously delivers with elegance a surprisingly rich and balanced smoke. It's available in three sizes at an affordable price. Be sure to ask your retailer for Saga Celez. And by Perdomo Cigars, awarded Nicaraguan Cigar of the Year in 2014 by Cigar Journal. The Perdomo 20th Anniversary Blend has continuously earned the highest scores in the industry and is a top seller in humidors around the world. The Perdomo 20th Anniversary Blend requires tobaccos that have been carefully hand-selected and are well-aged for a minimum of eight years. The Perdomo 20th Anniversary is offered in three distinct wrappers, a smooth, creamy Ecuadorian Connecticut, a rich, earthy Cuban seed Nicaraguan sun-grown, and a dark, oily Cuban seed Nicaraguan Maduro. Combining these beautifully bourbon barrel-aged wrappers with thick, high-priming binder and filler tobaccos gives each blend a balanced complexity with layers of rich flavors and smooth, elegant aromas. Perdomo Cigars, a family-owned and operated company headquartered in Miami, Florida, manufacturing and agricultural facilities in Esteli, Nicaragua. Perdomo's highly acclaimed cigar brands include the Perdomo Estate Selection Vintage, the Perdomo Double Aids 12-Year Vintage, the Perdomo 20th Anniversary, the Perdomo Reserve 10th Anniversary Champagne, Perdomo Abano Bourbon Rowler Age, Perdomo Lot 23, and many more. For great tasting notes and pairing information, check out the new Perdomo website at www.perdomocigars.com. And by Miami Cigar and Company, Nesta Miranda said it best, there's a mystery and depth to Africa that captivates my spirit, always drawing me to come back. This cigar, Don Lino Africa, captures the way going there makes me feel. Cigar making is an art form, but in the moment when the cigar becomes art itself, you have something special. Don Lino Africa returns from Miami Cigar and Company. The blend you remember blended even more massively this time in partnership with Tabacalera AJ Fernandez. It's an exotic and complex blend meant to mesmerize. Available in five bucks for Spatolas, Don Lino Africa returns. Ask for it at your local retailer. And by Drew Estate. Check out and download the Drew Estate app via mobile device. Keep up with everything going on, Drew Estate. Experience the subculture that is the rebirth of cigars. It's available on iTunes and Google Play. For more information, check out www.drewdiplomat.com. And as always, all the live streaming for the Primetime Networker shows is sponsored exclusively by Drew Estate, as well as the Primetime California Studios. Welcome, everybody. This is Primetime Episode 156. Today is Thursday, September 17th. This is Will September 17th? Yes, you're yes, good. I got it right. I got it right. <laughs> I, I, I had to double check. It's September 17th. It's Will Cooper. I am in uh, the Perdomo Cigar Studios, the palatial Perdomo Cigar Studios on the black stage here in North Carolina. I'm drawing cross country by my friend and colleague in the Drew Estate Studios on the Year to Ride stage, Mr. Aaron Loomis. How you doing tonight, Will? Uh, it's been a, a little bit of a rough couple of days. My back <laughs> went out, I think I was telling you, and uh, yeah. um, the Phillies just blew another lead. Uh, but, uh, yeah, it could be better. It could be better. Um, I can't say that. But it could be worse, too. Um, yeah. So, uh, no, it's pretty pretty good here. Um, we've, we've getting – and we'll be talking about, I know, wildfires a little later. But uh, yeah. we had, like, the remnants of a hurricane kind of come through here today. Mm -hmm. um, we just got – we got a lot of rain is what we got. Um, yeah. And I'll just say this kind of growing up in New York, you know, you got two inches of rain. It's um, – you can live with it, right? Yeah. But down here, it's not unusual to get eight inches of rain for, uh, coming down. So uh, I know people in the southeast are very used to that, but that's kind of something that's much newer to me. Um, and I don't live in a – lucky we don't have any flooding that's been reported, but Charlotte doesn't have rivers, but we have creeks. Mm -hmm. And these creeks, I think, are going to be interesting to see what happens the next couple of days if the okay. creeks start to swell up right now that that's where but i don't live in a flood zone thank goodness which is which is really good i don't have a basement which is really good as well mm -hmm. yeah so good but otherwise really good yeah um yeah so why don't we turn it over and, and introduce our special guest today um making his primetime show debut um long time uh friend of ours um Longtime supporter of ours um, on Cigar Coop and Developing Palettes, the one and only Santana Diaz of Pure Aroma Cigars. Santana, welcome to Prime Time. Thank you, Mr. Cooper. Thank you for having me. 
getting a little feedback there. Was that you or is that us? Uh, the feedback, like a sound? Yeah, like clicking we got. Yeah, I think it's okay. Okay, okay. Great. Okay, I just want to make sure. But, oh, Santana, great to have you tonight. Uh, are you, are you, you were in, uh, I guess, uh, headquarters, your office right now, right? This is my office. This is uh, a section that I created like a year ago. I used to be upstairs, so now we, you know, have an office down here. here yeah. Right, all right. But we store each other cigars, and we used to age a lot of uh, the first years. Now we're aging uh, uh, North of England and uh, Selection 512 and the 560 made in the Mexican Republic. That's great. Great. Um, no, it's great. I, I haven't been to your place, but I've heard very good things about this uh, warehouse. Everyone's like, who's gone there has said really good things about it. <laughs> yeah, Eric uh, from Gojo. Yeah, that's who went there. Jordan once, twice, actually. Yeah. yeah. So, it's, you know, it's a, it's a 40, it's a 50 by 40 by 14 high uh, cigar humidor. Uh, it's all cedar, roof, I mean, you know, ceilings, walls. It has a couple nice. of systems of um, humidity. And the AC is constantly at 70, so everything is controlled, you know, to, to, to the notch. Nice. That's great. So I know you did turn your air conditioning down. So if it does get too hot, turn it on. I don't, I don't want you to, <laughs> I don't want you, you know, to, to suffocate either. I installed you know, a new uh, administrator in this office here. So I'm going to throw it off as soon as it gets, you know, hot. Okay, great. Great. But, uh, but a pleasure to have you, Santana. Um, we always like to start the show. Um, and we'll get into some of your background. And, and of course, we're going to talk a lot about your latest line, Lords of England. But we always like to talk about what was your first experience like smoking a cigar? You know, before you got in the industry, uh, what, what was your kind of how did you get introduced to a cigar? What was that first experience like? Well, I think it was my father. I grew up in a, in a family home, uh, a household uh, it was four of us. Me, my sister, father and mother. And for some reason, my father always had a cloud of smoke all over the house. <laughs> uh, back in Cuba, people used to smoke everywhere. And my father was a very heavy smoker. So I grew up in this environment, smelling these aromas constantly. At the age of 14, I believe I started smoking cigarettes, uh, black tobacco, you know, brand, no filter. And uh, from, you know, from time to time, I used to pop my father's cigars. Uh, but uh, my first experience was with a Dahlia from A Nat A Paragas. That was my first uh, smoke. Very nice. nice. A big step up from one of all other people's first cigar is. Yeah, we hear we hear <laughs> we hear some stuff, uh, some stories, and that's probably one of the better ones. That for sure. So that's a hell of a way to start. I was gonna say. Well, that was my father's favorite. Uh, before the revolution, my father used to smoke uh, Marevas from uh, Bausa. Bausa was a brand that was made in Cuba. Only never was ported. Was only national. Uh, for Cubans to smoke, and that you know that's the kind of size you always smoke. The Marela is a 42, the Dahlia from Paragas is a 43. So he always had you know these cigars in his humidity at the house. So um, you know that was my first smoke. I was smoking cigarettes, very dark black tobacco. So when I got this Dahlia, it was it was normal. You know it was different. You know, you don't get that paper sensation. You know, it was a different experience for real. Yeah. You know, the times I tried cigarettes, and there were a few, I've tried filtered and unfiltered, and neither did it for me. And it was like, you're right. It was just like, I mean, I tried maybe two or three, and that was it. I just couldn't do it uh, after that. Yeah, well, you know, I mean, my father, uh, before the revolution, he never touched a cigarette, you know, in his life. After the revolution, I believe by 63 or 64, uh, Tabacalera Cubana, SA, got into a real trouble. Production levels went down, everything was disorganized. Uh, the cigar making was horrible due to the 
national association of the country. And uh, he stopped smoking cigars because they were bitter, not well made, you know, a lot of Thai cigars. So he told me, I, I stopped smoking cigars, you know, you know, in 63, 65, because they were really bad. So he got into cigarettes. But he always had some you know, stash in his humidor. Uh, not stuff that he was able to buy. Once he got, became uh, exports only. So he, you know, he had a couple of friends in different factories that he used to get his uh, couple of bundles of Lanceros, his Madevas. So he smoked those at night. You know, when he was yep. starting, I remember he was smoking those at night. You know? Yeah. So he was uh, a heavy smoker, smoking all day. <laughs> Uh, it's like my dad. <laughs> my dad's 75 and he smokes like a chimney, the guy. <laughs> um, so when did you come to, when did you come over to the U.S. I from came Cuba? I 95. I actually went from Cuba to Sweden in Europe and uh, from there I came here to the U.S. What led you to Sweden? Uh, you know, that was the way... But I was able to escape. When I was 15, I tried to escape in a, in a, in a draft. I got caught, you know, I was 15. They put me in prison for 10 days and they had to let me go because I was a minor. Oh, wow. So I said, well, you know, my next venture is going to be, you know, I'm, I'm going to keep trying until I succeed. So I was able to buy a little invitation to Sweden from a Swedish guy, and uh, I bought my ticket six months later, and I fled to Sweden. That was the only way. It was between Cuba and Sweden, there was no visa. You don't need a visa to travel. Okay, okay. Uh, How long were you in Sweden for? Uh, about 19 months, almost two years. Were you in Stockholm? Yes. I love Stockholm. I went there two years ago, probably this weekend, I think, or next weekend. It's like two years since I went there. I, I really loved it there. Yeah, it's, 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 it's completely different. It's, uh, you know, the Swedish uh, people are very calm. You know, they, they calculate everything. Everything is super organized, clean. I learn a lot from these uh, people. Really. Yeah. It was hard for me to smoke by, you know, because it was two years ago. It was hard to smoke in places there, but there were a lot of cigar smokers. I did see a lot of people smoking cigars. It was just hard to, that you don't smoke in a lot of shops there. Um, there's very few places you can smoke. So a lot of, it was still nice where people could smoke outdoors and things like that. Yeah, it's mostly the in and out stores you have. Yeah. I mean, when I was there, the pack of Marlboro was about 40 crowns. That's about seven to eight dollars. This is 95. In the U.S. was about a dollar something. Yeah, oh yeah. On alcohol, the Swedish government is on top of that, and they close the liquor stores about 6 p.m. Yep. You know, you know, yeah. They're very strict when it comes to that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's true. That's true. And then eventually, you made your way over to the U.S. Did you, did you go right to Miami from that point? Yeah. After they deny my um, citizenship there for different reasons. They uh, decided that I was not a political refugee and they uh, signed my letter of deportation. And uh, I'm not coming back to Cuba. You know, I, 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 I died before I go back to Cuba. Right. So yeah, I bought a fake passport and I was on my way to Miami. There you go, there yeah. you go. And, and you've, like I said, uh, since you've been here, I mean, you were, I know you've always been very proud to be an American. I mean, you've, you've used that theme in a lot of your lines, uh, you know, in the So, uh, you know, it's certainly, uh, you definitely have an, I feel you have an affinity for this company, which, which, which country, which is great. It is. This, 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 I mean, this country opened arms for a lot of Cubans. Our community here in Miami, uh, you know, it's, it's, this is our haven. Thanks to God, you know, we have what we have here in Miami. And yeah. Yep. So before you got into the cigar business, were you doing anything else? Yeah, I had a trucking company. That's right, yep. I had a trucking company. I started driving in 98. I was a driver. A year later, I bought my own truck. Two years later, I had a fleet. 
Yeah, that was my business. Oh wow! So were you like were you going cross country a lot of times in, like when you were trucking, or was it more local? How how were you doing that? All forty eight states. Oh wow! I know this country more than my own country, believe it or not. <laughs> oh wow! Oh wow! Yeah, there's some interesting driving you could do in this country for sure. So what kind of led you at some point? I mean, you, you've obviously had a you like cigars. What kind of said I want to get into the cigar business? In cigars in Cuba, um, you know we had a we had a situation in Cuba where you all know that uh, there's no private property or you, you know, wouldn't be able to do any businesses. So you know we started with like a kind of cigar making, an underground cigar making. Uh, you know that led me to make some money for me to be able to go. So when I left Cuba, I said this was a time in my life in where, uh, you know, it was not going to come back. But in 2004, five, I believe, my father called me from Havana I said, and told me, hey, listen, I have a guy in Costa Rica. He's a good friend of the family. And if you want to get into, <clears throat> if you want to get into this business again, let me know. So I called him and so he can call you and contact you. He said that I'm doing great with this trucking business. You know, this is not something something that I did, something that I love. Uh, I know that uh, you know it was rough. It was a rough time. It was an illegal business. Uh, I don't know. So I hang out and say, you know, I forgot about that. Somehow. My mind is started getting into those days. Yeah. And uh, I said to myself, you know what? Let me call this guy. So I called Jose and uh, we spoke over the phone. And I think, you know, I'm telling him, listen, I'm going to open a company. Okay. I'm going to get my importation permit. I'm going to get, I'm going to research in this cigar business in the US. And I'll call you back when all is done. Three months later, I called him back. I said, listen, the company is open. I'm still waiting for the interdiction permit. So let me visit you to see what you have. You know? So I did. Uh, he was working in his house. It was about eight to nine pairs, making cigars for some European uh, customers. And uh, I liked what I saw. I was off of the business. So uh, I had to come back, you know, to seek all these knowledge that I had. And uh, when I got back, then, you know, sometimes later I got my uh, interpretation permit. And um, the rest was, you know, history. Very good. And your first brand was De Crossier, correct? Yeah, De Crossier. So, how does a Cuban guy get the the Crossier name? How, how does that kind of all fit in? That's the name of uh, my family. And the Crossier is the last name of my father. Okay. It's a family name. He got that name, uh, last name from his mom. And uh, it was a family of French uh, people that immigrated into Cuba sometimes around the 1800s. The first who came, came from uh, France and I don't remember the day, but his name was Felix Crozier. That was the father, my great, great, great grandfather. And uh, that led me to Francisco Crozier, which was my father's grandfather. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, my father, he started telling me the stories about his family, his, you know, my grandma told him all the stories. And uh, my grandfather was a tobacco grower. He was a cigar fanatic. I remember the story when, when Francisco passed away, he passed away of tuberculosis. And uh, he died with his cigars in his hand, burning the cheeks. That's, you know, that was, uh, that was very impressive. So, you know, I mean, I never thought about putting a cigar brand under my name, you know, so I was, uh, my father was everything to me. 
the you know, I remember when you, we were just talking about this before the show started. Um, you and I met. Uh, I was down in uh, Miami with a friend of mine, and uh, we we got invited over to Eric Espinosa's place. And I think you popped in there that day. I had not. I had heard of the Crossy. I had never smoked a cigar. Um, you kind of showed me your cigars. Uh, you gave me a cigar. Remember? Um, it was. It was a Age. Yeah. Wow. That's a great memory. <laughs> yes, it was. It was. I remember, and you were saying it's 60. I said, no, I like 60. Um, you, you, that's a great memory. You, you gave that to me. Uh, it, was, it was a fantastic cigar. And then you, you, were, you were telling me a lot about the brand, right? And the cigar was unique. And then you were showing me some of your packaging and stuff. It seems like when you, you were doing things, you still do things, I think, a very set way in terms of your blends are very unique and the packaging you do is, is, is top notch is what you've, you've done like throughout, throughout all the time I've known you. Were those some goals that you had when you were creating the DeCrossier brand? Well, back in Cuba, I worked for, uh, uh, it's a cigar making, I mean, um, the box factory. Uh, in Havana, uh, you know, I worked there for six months and I quit. <laughs> but, uh, I opened my own shop, so we were making some packaging. Uh, we started making some humidors. So, you know, I have my background in cigar box making back in Cuba. Uh, I don't know, I mean, I have my style. It's, I don't know how they how the designs come to my mind, but uh, it's a unique way of packing cigars. And the packaging for me is super important. Uh, you know, how the cigars age and sear are completely different. You know, it's, it's a unique process what happens when you put a cigar in maple without cellophane and a cedar box. You know, so. You, um, you also, you're very particular about aging these cigars too. That's a thing I've noticed throughout what you've done is aging has been a very important component to what you do. Yeah, aging is everything. You gotta, you gotta age the cigars. You know? If you don't age them, you're not gonna get the result, you know, that at least what I'm looking for in a cigar. The way it tastes, how clean it is, flavors. So important, I mean, aging is everything. And every blend has its time. And you got to give them that time if you want to have a crazy one. There's even been very, you've already, you also use very unique cello at times. Yeah. Where the cellophane would have perforations in it so that there would be some, maybe more air exchange into the cigar through the cello. Yeah, the, the, the breathable cellophane came later. I used to pack the cigars without cellophane. Mm -hmm. When we got into the distribution with Espinosa, we were selling more cigars to more stores. And that idea of putting cigars in cellophane with white toes it was demanded from uh, many stores. And uh, for some reason, that idea came into my mind. I said, how did I find a solution so I can continue using my cedar boxes mm -hmm. and issue my cigars in this type of um, surrenders? So, you know, I, some, I don't know where the idea came from. But uh, I invented a machine and started punching the cigars. Well, at the beginning, we punch them by hand. Mm. Uh, in Costa Rica, we, we need the slots, you know, uh, in a vertical way. We did a couple slots with a selection by 12. And I gave, you know, the, the hand punch to uh, Jose and he put it to the factory. And we did a selection by 12 with this technique. And, uh, and it worked. You know, uh, the cedar gets to the cigar and the cigar's get to breathe. Right. Yep. Hold. And that was it. From that moment on, everything I do is uh, on punch elephant. Unless, like the Los Opinion, we have a lot of uh, printing uh, uh, material inside the box. Mm -hmm. I think, believe it or not, you know, uh, take some orders to, to the cigar. So we have to. Right. Keep them in cellophane, do not punch them, otherwise, they're going to taste like ink. 
Sure. Right. Yeah, I understand that too. And here is actually, I don't know if folks could see the preparation. I'm going to try to yeah, show that it. that was a very good one. We didn't have the machine back then. Yeah, oh, really? Okay. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, yeah, and this is a 512 Lancero, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Yeah, so, um, yeah, that was, and I always liked that too, because again, I, I kind of, you know, I'm always a guy who likes to keep the cellophane on. Um, you know, and I know, I know it's not necessarily the most popular thing, but it does protect cigars when I keep things long term. And that's just a great way. It kind of lets it breeze in the humidor, which is great. Yeah, if you keep them, I mean, if you keep the cigars in like, the different cigars in the humidor, you know, you may want to keep them. Yep. You're going to pair with, you know, with each other. So you, you built up a very nice following over the years. Um, you know, the brand became very popular. I know, uh, the, I started talking to the dojo guys. You got a cigar of the year out of the dojo guys. The brand was going really well. You you set up an, a, a distribution agreement with Eric Espinoza. Um, then there was kind of some a period where you went through some transitions. Um, the first thing was you kind of you, you and Eric went separate ways. Um, but it seemed like it was a very amicable thing from everything I've talked to you and him about. Um, but what, what what went into that decision to kind of uh, split the distribution agreement from Espinoza. It was, uh, unfortunately, it was a sad decision that I had to make. Uh, and to be honest with you, uh, Eric, this, you know, he did a fantastic job. We're still good friends. Uh, it, it wasn't his fault, it was my fault. And, uh, you know, the communication between me and the factory stopped. And to be honest with you, I don't want to open that book. Anytime. Sure. As it is, I don't have any uh, descendants or anything like that, but uh, it was some moments to me. You know, we, we just lost the first year at that moment. You know, and there it was in the middle of it. It was not there for him to get um, you know, all these phone calls, lock orders, you know. But it was a very sad time. You know, that's all I see. Sure, sure. I mean, so, and you mentioned, obviously, so it was right around that time, too, when you you left Costa Rica. Um, and that's when you started um, going, that's when you went over to the Dominican Republic after that. The kind of, and that's how I saw her, it was kind of a restart you did for the Crossier at that point. Yeah, I mean, when I went to Havana, you know, the Maragoro, Matia Maragoro, Alberto uh, Calderon, uh, we were friends from before. We were talking to make some cigars before, but I never made my decision of going to make a cigar with them. So I was working with a factory. Uh, so, you know, I mean, at that time, something happened in the family. It was uh, a really sad time for me. No, we understand. So, <clears throat> well, I mean, we didn't have the crozier anymore. So, we took a couple of years to, I was struggling a lot to, to the Maragoros. You know, we, uh, to me, I mean, I mean, for me, these people are family. And I took my time working with them when they were created the 512 over there and the 560. We still have some pending projects to do. But um, it was a time of you can't make new cigars in a set. Right. And, and I noticed you didn't try to re recreate what you did in Costa Rica you kind of worked with that factory with the strains and that's a good factory uh, that, you know, they, they make that the Villager cigars are laid out of there. You know, some really good Villagers that are coming out of that factory. You know, um, the Floridian clan is, is a favorite of ours, especially Aaron. So, I mean, there's some, so, so you have some different tobaccos you're able to work with and you kind of work with the resources you had there. Correct. Yeah. And not only that, I mean, it's two different countries, uh, two different factories. Even though you have almost the same tobaccos, it's not going to be the same. Right. So it's not the same. The way tobacco age in the mountains of Costa Rica is not the same way tobacco age in Santo Domingo. 
even the same tobacco. Believe it or not, I know that sounds crazy, but that's just the way it is. And then one component that you don't have, the blend comes different. Really? Honestly, I, I didn't want to replicate the 512, the, I mean, the way we had it in Costa Rica. That sure. I was, was a different time and a different deal. It was a collaboration between me and my ex partner. We blended together. So that's, that, you know, in, in, in the back of my mind, even though I know the blend, because I blended it with him. I, I made a decision that blend is going to stay there. You know, and all the blends that we did back then, until today, even though I get the same tobaccos working in the same country, they're going to stay in that factory. I create new blends. You know, better or similar, it's okay, but will not be the same. That's some kind of, you know, it's morality. It's morality in the business that I, that I think is have to be ethical. You know? what sure. What happened stayed in the past. It's not a good... Uh, ethical decision to bring something that you're doing with someone in partnership in harmony and bring it into a new factory and do the same thing. You know, it's a knowledge that belongs to that factory, and this knowledge is going to be in a new factory with a new blend, with a new technique, with a new rolling system. However, the factory works, you have to adapt to the factory that you go to work with. Right. No, that makes sense too. And I think, like I said, I think you were always very transparent about that, that, hey, you know, you've, you've, you've gone to this new factory, you're creating new blends there. And I've respected that, um, you know, a lot because I think that that's, that's an ethical way to do it too. I, I, you know, to say, you know, if you just kind of didn't say you were switching factories, people would know right away. It's not, the, you know, it's not going to be the same. And so, yeah. It's impossible to replicate something like that. Yeah. Even if you have the same tobacco, it's almost impossible. Yeah, but you mentioned that the that sometimes just aging the same tobaccos, uh, in Costa Rica versus uh, Santo Domingo, they're, they're different. Is that just because of the climate and the and climate, the geography? Climate and the factory. Okay. So each of those bales, uh, the organic material, you know, the genetic that goes there, all those molecules staying there for years in that. Uh, that aging room that you have your bales is going to be. For that particular factory, every factory has its own smell. Don't you notice when you go to the factory, the smells different than the other? You know, even though some tobaccos are the same, the factory smells different. Every factory smells different. It does, yeah. And tobacco is all about that. It's a hydroponic uh, plant. We absorb everything around it. So Costa Rica is in the middle of the forest. You know, we have a lot of vegetation. At night, the humidity is great. So, yeah, that's the difference between, you know. Yeah. I mean, when you go to Nicaragua, you go to Estelí and you smoke cigars, let's say, at uh, a Nick store, uh, factory. And then you come to Miami and they, they, they taste a little bit different, you know? I, I've had that happen. Um, and I and I actually have, I've had it happen in all, probably every country. The one that I remember the most was, I was in the Dominican Republic and we were smoking Cohiba red dots at the general factory and they were smoking like totally different than like what we had. Um, and then we took some back and it, they seemed different once they came back again, you know, something seemed to happen. It was like a bunch of us were noting that we were just, you know, so we kind of saw, and I know Eric's talked about this with me too, that they just, there's something that happens when these things transport too, that, that you can't control. Can't control. It don't have to do with humidity. Remember, when you pump a cigar that you inhale, you're getting all this oxygen go through the channels. You know, and that makes a difference. Oh, I agree. So if while you, you have, yeah. if you it to that magnitude, if you have that kind of palate to in order these type of uh, changes, some people don't don't get that. Yep. No, I, I totally understand that. So you, you, you worked on starting to reset the Crossier, and then this other project comes along last year, um, which I want to talk a lot about, um, and that's Lords of England, um, where you've kind of taken this, this old brand and brought it back. So let's, talk, let's turn our attention there. What kind of got your interest in Lords of England as a brand? Well, I saw Lords of England, I believe it was around 2008. I got a multimedia in my hands. A friend of mine gave it to me. I didn't even know who made this multimedia. Multimedia is a CD. It's an old, it's, 
It was made in 1995. Okay, it's a, it's a box of, a paper box with a CD inside, with all the data of brands and factories and everything about Cuba. And I got this multimedia in my hand and I started going through it. And I saw the movie called Cigar, all the Cuban brands, Carvajal, all, all these brands. And then the Laws of England was in front of my screen. When I saw it, this is what I saw. Let me tell you what I saw because now I have the original of what I saw. What okay. Here it is. And as you can see it there. Oh, wow. That's the it original Lord of England Papaleta from 1920. Oh, wow. You can see the back of it. It's, you know. Yeah. Yeah. As the blue and everything here. <laughs> So this is the first thing I saw. When I saw when I saw it, it got my attention. The House of the Lords, okay, talking about whatever, who knows? And the artwork, you know, this golden uh, emblem of England. And I saw it. I liked it. And I forget about it. Uh, then it was like a calling. You know, it was like. You know, I was working on the crossier and I had it there. I didn't, I didn't even register the brand. So then, you know, so Alfonso is a good friend of mine. I don't know if you guys know him. The yep. Captain Marte, yeah. We were talking about this multimedia because he was the actor of the multimedia. He was the one who made it. Hmm. I found out that later. But he told me <laughs> I was the one who made that multimedia. I said, really? And uh, then, then we started, you know, speaking about a lot of England. And he said, Dan, you know what? I have all the originals that you're going to need. And he's the one who gave me this original, of course. Uh, he's a collector as well. Right. So he gave me this. And then he gave me the Bofeton, the original Bofeton. Oh, uh, hold it. Yeah. Wait, uh, say something just so it could go on the screen. Like, hold it back up again, Santana. Yeah. And just say something when it comes up. And yeah, this is the original Bofetone that goes in. I mean, people who doesn't know what the Bofetone is, it goes inside the box like this. Okay. And then he gave me the Vista. And you see, it. that's the Vista. That's the original Vista from 1920s. So I say, well, this is a calling. I mean, this, this brand is calling me, you know? And I still didn't register the brand. <laughs> We're working on the case here. And then one day I get to my computer and I go to eBay and I put, and I input those of England boxes. I was looking for a box. And this is what I found. I found a box of Lords of England imported in 1907. You can see the name inside. This is a lot of England by E and E. I, I, I'm going to explain what E and E means later. Okay. With the uh, 1916 you wanted to seal. So then the next day, I registered Lord of England. <laughs> the brand. I went and it was available. It was abandoned by Taddis, so I took it. So it wasn't a difficult process to get that at that point. I don't know. Brand. Cost me $175. Oh, wow. Nothing. I registered it myself. So that, you know, that's, that's how, that's how most of England got to pure Roma. You know, uh, then um, it was there for a while. In 2016, it was still there. Then I got the band. Also, I got the original band. So that moment on, the research started, you know? I was investigating on this brand that you can't imagine. Everything. It's really hard because it's not a lot of stuff I've on the internet about the Rose of England. Nowadays, I have a lot of information, but back then it was. Uh, yeah, no, even when I was reviewing it and I was doing some of the background, most of the background I got from what you had come up with, uh, that you had sent us, uh, there wasn't a lot out there on the internet. I mean, you could find some of the pictures and stuff, but that was pretty much it. Was pretty much it, yeah. I believe Half Wheel made a, a review when they figured out a size from a 50 box of uh, 
50 bucks count that he got from some guy in Switzerland. It was a trade that Brooks did. And, uh, you know, when I saw that, I said, wow, look at his review. And then he, you know, he. He's they, into that. Brooks is into those, like, really old brands. I, you know, I can tell you that. They documented some information, and it led me to find more information. So, you know, this brand has been on my investigation for many, many years. Yep. Uh, it was like a passion for me to look into you know, the stuff of my country that I even knew back then. Uh, and I have, right now, I have a lot of information and general knowledge of how the Cuban industry, uh, tobacco industry, worked back then, like 1974 to the 19, you know, until the revolution. Mm -hmm. So um, that's how it came about. That's how it was discovered. And that's how it was uh, you know, developed into my mind. Yeah. You, in a brand, a little background on the brand, it was a brand that was made in Cuba and was originally sold in Europe and then it eventually made its way to the U.S., correct? Yeah, this brand, this uh, Lords of England brand was created by... Uh, he was a figure in the cigar industry back in the day. And then there was uh, Gustavo Bach. You probably heard about the Bach mm -hmm. stuff. Yep. Uh, stuff like that. Yeah, I mean, he, we don't know if he, if he was the one who made it. All we know is that he was the one uh, who purchased the Henry Clay factory and mm -hmm. became the Henry Clay and Bach Corporation Limited. And I have, I have proof here in a bulletin from Cuba, it was an industrial bulletin of commerce of 1907, saying that the other thing that was owned by Henry Clay. So it was June, it was in June 17th, 1907. So oh, it, was, wow. it was, you know, it's real. So it was registered by, by uh, uh, and the main logo, the main logo in the brand in another type of uh, uh, in another type of box, the name of the metal was Gustavo Bach. Right, so it's, you did a variation of that. So we know that uh, he was somehow involved in the process, and uh, we know also that the brand was distributed in England because that Henry Clay and Bach Corporation then was acquired by an English trust that was formed under Bach. So he was probably, you know, they be, probably demanding some development for their country. And that's how the lot of England got to Europe. Mm -hmm. The English backing that they were getting. Uh, so we know after that, that this brand with the McKinley tax, the tax center for McKinley rose the uh, tariff in tobacco uh, in the thousands. Uh, ATC, which is the American Tobacco Company, took the brand to New Jersey and many other brands. So this brand was also made in New Jersey and it was distributed in New England, Chicago, many clubs, many hotels, and it was a staple uh, in the US market back in the 1920s, right after Gustavo Bach passed away. Yeah, they made a lot of cigars in Trenton. Uh, which I didn't, I used to live not far from there. I didn't realize how many cigars they used to make in Trenton, New Jersey. I'm still uh, researching where the factory was. I can't find it. I don't know. I couldn't tell you where it is either. I just know that they did a lot of that. Yeah. I can't find any trace of where the factory was. I know that maybe it was an American Tobacco Company uh, factory because in, I believe it was in, um, in 1902, um, uh, James. Uh, Buchanan Duke was the owner of American Tobacco Company. Mm -hmm. they, I mean, the biggest cigarette factories in, in the U.S. Then he went to Cuba, and then he created the Havana Trust with Gustavo. And they finally purchased the English Trust as well. So that's how this brand goes into the American Tobacco Company, because they purchased the, the, English, I mean, the English Trust. Right. And it was still a Cuban tobacco they were using with this. It was still Cuban. To yeah, when he moved to New Jersey, I believe it was 90%. Okay. Virginia wrapper, some Connecticut Virginia wrapper with the uh, Cuban filling. 
Okay. Because that's the way they used to do it. Remember the money, I mean, I mean it, was, it was heavy on tax, you know, taxation was really, really heavy. Oh, wow. Um, so the brand, the brand itself, it eventually went dormant. Was that because of the embargo? I, don't, I mean, you know, Cuba discontinued a lot of brands. You know, a lot. I mean, when 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 the nationalization of the country, I mean, of, of Castro, there's a lot of brands that got discontinued. I believe they reorganized uh, the industry and selected a few brands to be exporting goods, you know, brands into old customers. Mm -hmm. And the those are things that got discontinued. It was not, it was not even in the books anymore. You know, nobody knew about this brand. Yeah, because like I said, I hadn't heard, I, I'm going to be honest, I hadn't heard of it until it had come back and then it kind of piqued my interest a lot too, as you were announcing this. So you, you you have the trademark, and then the next step is now you want to go create a cigar to represent that brand. So what was that process like in terms of what was some of the steps you did that you wanted? What were you looking for with this cigar to be? Well, before uh, we spoke to Nick Perdomo, I was working on replicating the same exact artwork. I mean, we went down almost 90% of the replication of the original artworks that I had. Uh, now with the intention of making it yet, I said to myself, I'm gonna start working on this project. This is not an easy thing to do. You have to vectorize everything. You have to separate what you're gonna impose, what you're gonna, it's, it's a huge development, okay? And um, next thing you know, <laughs> I'm in a board meeting with my associates uh, this is 2018, sometime, yeah, 2018. Uh, 2018, yeah. And we were discussing if we have a new brand order the proceed to do. And I said, well, I have something that I've been working on for quite a while now. The artwork is almost 9% in. And uh, if you guys want, we can bring this back. You know, I'm, I have years of his investigation of this brand. I pretty much know everything about this brand. Uh, and you can market it. It's a beautiful name and it sounds super good. Uh, and one of, one, one of my associates said, okay, how, how do you feel if uh, Perdomo makes it? And I said, what? I said, yes, how do you feel about that? I said, fantastic. Nick Perdomo, are you kidding me? Yes, why not? So next thing you know, let's day we're in a, in a car on the way to Nick Perdomo's uh, headquarters. Perdomo's lawyer is in Miami. And um, uh, Nick was there, out to Kemper, me to Cuba, Jenny, his wife, and Nicholas, his son. And uh, we sat down at a big table. You've probably been there. Yep. Conference room. That big conference room, yep. <laughs> and uh, I, you know, I didn't know. I never knew Nick before. I met him once in 2011 uh, in the public. Um, it was uh, the Newman's made a convention in Ripaki. Uh, it was a public thing. I don't even really remember. And we met there and we never spoke. So I never, you know, met Nick in my life. Uh, you know, like I've like been, you know, like talking to him. And, uh, the thing you know, he started talking. We asked, you know, we asked him, can you do this brand for, 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 I mean, for our company? And uh, he said, sure, that's right, what it is, you know. And then, you know, we started developing this brand uh, with Adder. Uh, it took us about six months to develop. It was a lot of back and forth of, are we going to replicate it or are we going to create a new thing? So I finally, you know, we finally, Concluded that uh, okay, let, let, let's not reproduce something that was made. Let's create something out of it. And you know, if you can see the artwork, it's completely different. See, we took some of the elements of the original artworks and incorporated. Yeah. In the way 
you know, Perdomo made his development. Yeah, that's some of the shelf talking, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, it, it, for me, it was a good experience. When you work in harmony with good people, good things happen. Yeah, I mean, from every point of view. Right. Uh, but, you say something? No, go ahead. You can fit. go ahead. I'm not the best speaker in the house, okay? You're fine. You're doing fine. You're doing fine. So when you work with great people, good thing happens, you know? Uh, I thought it took about probably two to four months in the daily, you know, me going there and working with him. Uh, a lot of uh, arguments, but it's a lot. He's <laughs> fantastic. Actually, he's, he's, he's amazing. Prince, the prince of everybody. That guy is a genius. Uh, very passionate, you know, very honest, outspoken. I like that about him. Yep. <laughs> uh, and then Nick, too. Nick is a great guy. You know, I mean, you can't deny that he's a, an enlightenment. And that's the way I say it. You know, he's always advising me and stuff. And uh, he was putting his opinion on this. Nicholas, the whole family got involved. We all got involved into this. It was deeply difficult to finalize this process. Okay? Uh, especially with me. I'm, I'm super picky about everything. And uh, for the first time in my life, I was very tolerant. Uh, you know, tolerance goes to me. Uh, I was not, I didn't want this packaging. I want my cedar boxes, I want this. And I want right, that. right, right. <laughs> and that took came to me and said, Santana, listen, we have an organization that is, it, it works like you can't imagine. You gotta go to our factory to understand it. So I went and when I get back, I said, yes. You know, I agree. I mean, they, it's, 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 this, I mean, this organism, it, it works so fast and so, you know, uh, how can I say, it? so exact. Of every every move these people make in their production is unique. Everything is perfect. Everything is clean. So they package. I mean, the packaging department is is, 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 is what it is. They're not gonna buy a, a pack of seal, you know, from Brazil to make my boxes. Uh, so I understood that. So I say, okay, uh, let's do it. You know, let's do it your way. Let's do it the way. Let's see how see what happens. I'm gonna. I like it. I don't I mean I don't I love it, you know, but I wanted more. So and that's how it came about, you know. And I I love it. Yeah, Nick doesn't take on a lot of contract brands. I mean he's very particular about that. Um so he mu there was something he must have been very intrigued with this project to take it on. I mean, I think that Nick Perdomo is uh is a industry figure you know this yeah. guy been this for 30 years he built everything from scratch working hard sacrificing a lot of stuff in his life to be able to make it to this point and you're right he doesn't he doesn't get he doesn't get involved with this type of development yeah. at all. no that he's he doesn't i mean i was on the factory tour as well and and there's only a few contract brands that i saw there when, when i was there um, and you're oh. right. That's a, that's an amazing. F I tell people, that's that's a one of a kind factory tour when you go on that thing. It is. For some reason, he he said yes. I mean, yeah. I like him a lot. I don't know if he likes him in the same way, but uh, you know, I mean, we our communication is is great. You know, we we get along pretty well, and that's a big factor. I, I, I yeah. Think. Yeah. Yeah. What, what, did you have any reservations, not maybe about Perdomo, but, you know, you've made cigars in Costa Rica and the Dominican, but you really hadn't made anything in Nicaragua. Was that something that maybe, did you have some reservations or, you know, that's just something different for you? Or was that, you know, hey, I'm going to go to a tribe because I know I'm working with Perdomo. I'll be honest. I have a lot of friends in Nicaragua, you know, and I've been in Esteli many, many, many times. And I visited a lot of factories there. Uh, I never thought about working in Nicaragua before. You know, and it, it, it never came across my mind. Like I said, this is, I mean, this whole development is something that it came out uh, with an idea, and it grew into into a great brand. Yeah. Um, and you opted when you created this. There's you did a Connecticut and a Maduro. 
Yeah, initially we were going to make uh, we were going to make a uh, an editor only. Hold on, let me get some water. Okay. Go ahead, go ahead, take it down. Well, 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 go ahead. So while Santana's going, um, yeah, I'm getting updated on the on the Phillies blowing another. Workman game. just stepped in and he just gave up a leadoff bomb to oh, him. Oh so. come, on. you're right about him, Aaron. <laughs> Why is he? Oh, this is gonna end. This is not gonna be good. It's not over though, right? So we still could come up uh, uh, and, and get it. But it is seven six the Mets right yeah. now. Yeah, I mean he gave up a hit to Conforto right after that, but then he got an out. So. Yeah. No. That's. <laughs> oh, geez. Uh, this is just. Uh, uh, you can always count on Philly to lift your spirits. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Aaron. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's just this just painful right now. Um, to be a Phillies fan as we uh head into the final two weeks of the season right now. Oh, geez. Um, uh, it's <laughs> it just never ends right now. And the and the and, and the worst thing is if the Phillies don't make the playoffs and, and Gabe Kapler makes the playoffs, I'm never gonna hear the end of it. Gonna, just wait. Just, just wait. wait. <laughs> I'm just I'm counting on Kapler blowing this in the last two weeks. <laughs> oh my goodness. Come on, guys. And then uh the uh so yeah, just stay tuned on that right now. Yeah, but I guess we still have uh we still can come up. Yeah. We, we, but the Mets are still batting right now, is what I'm saying right now. Yeah. So. Uh, what a terrible, what a terrible uh, thing to be baseball fan. Okay, I'm back. All right, good. All right. So we were just thanks, no problem, Santa. So we were just talking about the blends, and we started. You started saying that you originally were going to go with a Connecticut. Yeah, the original idea was to get three sizes. I mean, you guys understand how difficult uh, it was for this company to do something with us because the FDA. Yeah. The FDA was right in the middle of everything. And, uh, you know, the substantial approval in the process. So, uh, believe it or not, it was a great gesture that until whatever happens, if the FDA is heads or not, uh, I'd be for, forever grateful to this family for giving me six sizes, not only three, six sizes in two plants. <laughs> you know, that means a lot to me. It's always going to mean a lot to me. Uh, so, yeah, we're going to, I mean, originally, was, I mean, the Connecticut was the, uh, the development, I said, no, I need more. I need more. I need 48 inches on the shelves. You know, I, I don't do anything with half or 20 inches. I need, mm -hmm. I need more exposure. Which is something that Nick will talk about that and companies Nick, need. He'll talk about that. Nick, that's how important Nick, it is. Yeah, Nick, Nick said, yeah, yeah, you're right. 48 inches is, is, is what you need. Otherwise, you're going to get lost. Yeah. So in, in, in stores, especially with you know, this type of uh, artwork that is gorgeous. So, you know, I mean, from Connecticut, we're going to Maduro. And in the process of creating the artworks, Arthur always tell me, Santana, the cigars are the least rewards. That was his voice constantly. Because I was constantly, uh, you know, imposing less blend, less blend, less blend, you know? And he's like, you don't have to worry about that. That is, you know, it's easy. That's easy. That's the easy part of it. Uh, I didn't believe it, but it was, you know, it was Nick, him, and uh, Mr. Cuba, they presented a few blends, and it was so easy that I choose one, and I said, this is it, in both of them, in the Maduro and the Connecticut. Nick's tobaccos are incredible, okay? If you go to the factory and you see the bell inventory, it goes on and on and on, so you can choose by years, okay, what kind of visa you want, what kind of behavior you want, all that type of stuff. So all I make some recommendations that this is what I want, guys. You know, I want something that is sweet, number one. Uh, I want, I mean, I want something that burns, uh, doesn't go off because it has uh, too much behavior in it. I don't want something super strong. I want something medium, mild or medium. Flavorful, healthy profiles, but the sweetness have to be there. That's all I said. Right. You know, so Nick is a genius in what he does. You know, so he probably read my mind and presented the right blend. And it was extremely easy, like I to say. It was a, it was a cliche. When I smoked that robusto, which is my favorite, Connecticut, and I said, I inhale that stuff. I said, this is my favorite. This is what I want. How long am I gonna age it? I asked. He said, you don't have to worry about that. You're going to let you for six months. <laughs> Beautiful. That's what I mean. 
six months. Okay, and you know, that was it. Very good, very good. Aaron, I'm sorry, were you saying something or was that nope, just... you're good. Okay, okay good. I, I didn't want to... So, yeah, so, so you got the, the cigars are now out on the market right now. Uh, how are they doing? They're doing great. Ooh. I'm waiting for my second chip. Nice. That's great news. Second batch is coming, you know, and it's going into stores right now. Yeah. How would you describe the Maduro cigar? I mean, we're gonna I'm, we're gonna talk about the Connecticut in a second. Aaron and I will talk about what we're smoking, but how would you describe the Maduro cigar to folks? The Maduro is it's a good cigar, but it's not my favorite. Okay, the Connecticut mm. blend is my favorite. Right. For sure. Uh, you know, it's a Mexican San Andres. It's not a strong Maduro. It's a moderate medium. It's a, I would say to me, it's moderate medium. Some yeah. people, it's a medium. It's not a full body stick. Cigar. You can get the, I mean, it's, it's earthy, has a sweetness to it, it burns beautifully. You know, it's, it's, it's uh, price point is right, mm -hmm. in my opinion. I mean, I, I think it's underpriced, but you know, that's the way we discuss it, and, uh, and, that, that, and that's how we agree on And that's the price, it's seven, it's seven dollars for the Robusto, it's seven fifty for the uh, it's a 50 by six, which is, uh, which is the total, and the structure is uh, eight dollars. You know, I mean, the best in the Maduro for me is the Chocho. You know, I mean, for some reason, smokes a lot better than the Robusto and the Toro. Mm -hmm. The best size for me on the um, on the Connecticut is the Robusto. My favorite. You know, people have different opinions, but that's my you know, That's the way I, I, I see it. Understood. Understood. Now, um. What what are the plans for the brand going forward? Any plans maybe to expand the brand? Right now we we um, we on that. Okay. You know, I mean, we need to accessorize this brand. You know, accessorize means you know we need to get some accessories around them. We need to get into more stores. We need to get into a lot of stuff. This is a baby right now. We carry this baby. You know, it's just the beginning of something. Let's see how far it goes. I have high hopes on it. Yeah, I mean, uh, it and it does take a while to, to, you know, resurrect the brand to a point where it's, you know, where, you know, to build a brand up, it takes a long time. You can get the cigar, it's great, but building the brand up takes takes much longer there. I mean, I mean, right now is what I call the testing period, which is the first bash going out to some uh, stores. And those stores are reordering. The first batch came, you know, I mean, it's, it's being consumed by the same store. We not open new accounts uh, due to me not traveling, you know, different factors, okay? Uh, we don't have any sales reps, we don't have anything. It's just me on the phone or going someplace that I can reach, okay? I can probably not go to New York, but I can go to the Miami stores or West Palm Beach, you know. So the accounts we have, they have eight this batch, okay? Mm -hmm. So that's a good thing. That's a good thing, yeah. You have like, you know, one store can eat 14, 15 boxes in two months. That's not bad, you know? Yep. It's not too bad. So that's very it's good. So yeah. the testing period is done. I mean, we'll see what we can do. Well, no, I think you're off to a good start with it, Santana. We'll give you our, we're going to give you some feedback uh, towards the end on, on our smoking experience with it. Um, so that's great news. Aaron, anything else on Lords of England we want to hit? Uh, I don't think so. I think you hit it all. Okay. Santana, anything else we want to mention on Lords of England that we may have left out? Uh, it's worth it. <laughs> you see the Nicaragua word uh, right, right under? Yeah, yeah. That was uh, Mr. Kempis' idea, and he nailed it. Nice. So the font, you got the font. Like, that font has a very old-school feel to it with that font. Yeah, the laws of England, we I mean, we vectorized it from the original. For the Nicaragua War, our award, we, we did that font. That is a main font to be similar to the vintage font. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, Arthur Kemper, you mentioned him. 
I know he's a stickler to detail. This, this banner behind me is like a second iteration. He wasn't happy with the first one, and there were like subtle changes he wanted on that second banner. So he, he said, throw the other banner out. I'm sending you a new one. <laughs> and when I looked at it, they looked identical, and I had to call him up. I'm like, did they send me the right one? And then he started, yeah. he started looking. He said, hey, and he, I was on the phone and showing him, and he's like, here are the differences. It was amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, now, yeah, I can see, I can see what you're saying with that. Um, you know, Santana, you mentioned you had some real, like, there's a lot of like, like, classics that you've had. I know you don't have them anymore, but, um, what were some of your favorites in that classic line? Like, I could tell you that original Golden Blend is is probably the best cigar that I've had from you. That is, that's, an, I remember we had that uh, in Florida. Um, I mentioned the Lancero. That was just a great – I'm not a Lancero guy, great Lancero. Um, talk a little about, like, some of those classic blends right now that you've done. Golden blend was an idea of, you know, I mean, the name came from the rapper. We got these gorgeous, which is the golden – I mean, the first golden blend, the golden blend seven. Uh, the rapper was gorgeous. It was golden to me. It was so pink, reddish, brown. It was a Colorado Plato. Uh, and the blend, the, I mean, the tobaccos was, I didn't even talk about that, but he said the tobaccos were crazy good. Yeah. So I came out with that name, saying, you know, this is a golden blend. This is, the name is golden, so it's a golden blend. So later on, I said, you know what? Let's make this golden blend a series of some rare stuff that we have in that factory. And let's create is an area with the golden blend continues, you know, in that category. Yeah. Attention to the construction, the packaging, all the bands, everything was really serious on that golden blend. You know, it was a series of, of three blends, the golden blend seven, the golden blend 10 years. Um, what was the other one? What was the other golden blend? Seven, 10 years. And the original one was. was yeah. Was three of them. Uh, that was, you know, the concept behind the golden blend is to make everything so unique and so perfect and the aging minimum one year. I wouldn't put that rule. I guarantee you, I age it myself. <laughs> uh, other, I mean, the other line was the 512, those cans. Oh, yeah. I still have, I still have my cans upstairs. So oh, my four ring gauges, you know, the Coloniales and the 46 Corona Gorda and the 48 Emoso. I selected the sizes and we blend based on that. And the idea of putting it in cans, that was from, you know, my partner Jose, he came up with that idea. Uh, we laminated that, we see that inside and the blend was, to me, the uh, Corona Gorda was one of the best blends on that series. I, I love that one, yeah. I love that one as well. And then, you know, another favorite of mine was the Laforte. Um, when you those that you want to talk about aging some cigars, they would age great. Yeah, La, La Forte, La Forte. Believe it or not, I put a viso on the Nijero. They were very thick on that blend. The robusto was a bomb. We had to age those cigars for twenty four months to melt to I mean, to melt I mean, down. You know the original idea of. That brand was making 2,000 boxes every year, number the boxes on the bottom, and four sizes. Uh, with the Costa Rican wrapper that you know, Jose was growing in uh, uh, Costa Rica. And the packaging was gorgeous. You know, I mean, we, we used a cedar that was super aged for the first batch. And we have to lack a piano out box like eight layers on top of to be able to cover these solid woods. And uh, you know, the aging on that box, we we'll have that box keeping and pussy rods in there. Because that cedar was very, very unique. And the, and the bullet, the bullet on that day was my favorite. Really. Yeah. Okay, that way. was, a, I like, that was a size I liked as well. By five on one yeah. That was my yeah. Yeah. No, I, I agree. That was a that was one of my personal favorites that uh like I said they, and they just aged out. Um 
Like if you still got some of them, they're 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 a real treat, is what I'll tell people. Um, I have a few boxes. I have not much. I have a few boxes. I, <laughs> I have a few boxes of everything. I always do to see how they go in eight years, in ten years. Yep. I have cigars there from 2007. Oh, <laughs> I like bet. When you come, I give you one. Okay. Or yeah. Two. Yeah. Yeah. And then you know, we were mentioning the you know when when I met you. Uh, you know, that, that was at Trabuco. That was part of the Diplomacy Series. That was another one that... Um... Yeah, the Trabuco was a part of the Diplomacy Series. It was also a four size. Yeah. The ring gauge Trabuco with a pigtail on the bottom. That was the invention of yeah. Jose's, I think it was Jose's customer or he invented that, you know, to cover, um, to twist the foot with the wrapper. I disagree with that. Like, you can't imagine, uh, you know, because the aging process that uh, it takes so so long it takes super long because you know, it's, it's, it's a close foot but uh it worked you know yeah no, it it definitely it definitely did there um as far as that goes yeah, um it was, it was a great you, stuff. Got memories there, you know yeah the memories we have yeah oh yeah absolutely Absolutely. Um, you know, speaking of memories, we were just talking about this before the show. Um, you had, uh, there was the, um, the humidor that you had um, at the beach club. Mm. And yeah, that was just an awesome humidor. Like you go in, there, you, they had this beach club and you go in there um, and they had this the Crossier humidor and you had all your stuff there. It, it was great. You said that they closed down since then, right? Yeah, it's closed down. They're going to demolish it and they're going to rebuild a new development. But it goes up to $100 and something million. It's going to be gorgeous. Oh, really? It's going to be a residential hotel. So they're going to have residents buying apartments and there's going to be room for, you know, applying as a hotel. It's going to mm -hmm. be like a mini mall in the bottom, a lot of stores like Gucci and all this high end stuff is going to go on the bottom. It's going to be about four or five floors. And they have helicopters standing. You know, it's going to be a great development. Yeah, it was. It was a really neat place. I mean, you had to kind of drive over this little bridge to get to it, and uh, there was a guard there and everything. And uh, it was. It was the Grove Isle, right? That was the name of the place. Palmeiras Beach Club, right? Grove Isle. Yeah. yeah, it was. It was great. Uh, and you go in the humidor, right? And there's this big oil painting of Santana. It's it's that it's a beautiful oil painting. Except, who did that painting for you? Is that was that custom done? Yeah, it was custom done. Yeah, yeah it was beautiful. It was beautiful. Yeah, it was You have to put your face behind it. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, Aaron, anything else on Santana? I got one last question for him. Otherwise, yeah, go ahead. All right, Santana. This is uh, and then we'll talk. We'll finish up what we're doing. What we're smoking. Um, so Santana, uh, this is our cattle baron steak question, as in, you know, eating meat, steak. And I want to know what your favorite type of steak is. Ribeye, black Angus, bone. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in, I'm in. Uh, I knew you and I think well alike. Oh, uh, that's awesome. 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 So uh, let's get it. Let's wrap up with what we're smoking tonight. Um, and as always, that's sponsored by Tailored Smoke, located in the heart of downtown Charlotte's epicenter. And now just outside the Charlotte Motor Speedway in Concord, North Carolina, Tailored Smoke is your one-stop shop for Tailored Smoking experience. So Aaron and I are both smoking the Lords of England uh, cigar. Uh, Aaron, you're smoking the church. I'll have you go first. Yeah, so this is the, I think it's the number three is the, the Vitola name, right? The church show, right? Um, yeah, this is, an, this is a nice cigar, and it's, it's interesting the way that um, the flavors kind of hit you because on like when you initially draw on it, I think you get a lot of the wrapper from it first. So you get some of that kind of like uh, hay kind of grassiness with some sweetness there at the, at the very start. And then as the kind of the smoke goes across your palate, you start getting some of the, I think, the filler with the, kind of some deeper wood notes, a little bit of black pepper in there. So it kind of finishes a little bit fuller than it starts. So it really get, allows you to kind of get a taste for some of the different tobaccos in the blend. Um, and the construction is impeccable. I mean, the, the burn is razor sharp. Um, draw is perfect. Um, and in the Churchill size, you got a, long, a really long smoking time. I'm, I'm halfway through the cigar and, you know, we're an hour and 20 minutes into the show. So it's uh, 
definitely good value, I think, for the money as well. So it's a, it's a well done cigar, Santana. Yeah. Yeah, Santana, I, I can agree with you, uh, Aaron, on, on about everything on that. I get a little uh, – Aaron nailed it with some – at the beginning of that cigar, you get that wrapper, and he mentioned some of the wood notes, uh, the black pepper. I get a little bit of cedar in there as well, uh, a slight creaminess uh, to it. Um, what I kind of really liked with is it really felt like an old-school cigar to me. So you hear that expression, grandfather's Connecticut. This is kind of what I would expect. When you sit down and smoke this thing, there's a lot of nuances with this cigar. It's not just a very straightforward cigar. It's got some complexity. It, it does some transitions with it. And I'm smoking the number two Toro. Um, and like I said, it's, it's not going gonna, it's not gonna to be very heavy at all. Uh, it's, a, it's a cigar you could smoke any time of the day, uh, yeah. which, which I think is great. Um, so because I like a Connecticut sometimes at night. And, you know, I get, and it, it's got great flavor with this. So I think you nailed – I think you nailed the blend, but I also think you kind of brought back a an old school vibe with this cigar Santana that um, I think makes it. You know, a lot of people are trying to reinvent Connecticut. This is this is straightforward, um, and it's really good. So this is really good work. You did a great job with this. Yeah, with it. Yeah. You know, I put it as a weed because it's, it's yeah. Um, no, absolutely. The, the Perdomo, and it's not like a Perdomo cigar either. That's the no, other it thing. Doesn't, yeah. doesn't taste like any Perdomo. Cigar. It doesn't taste like any Perdomo. Yeah. Not at all. Yeah. Yeah. I get that a lot. Yeah. Yeah. So that's great. But it was a, uh, you know, it was a combination of many things together. And like I said, when you blend or develop or do anything in, in, in harmony and happiness, you know, thing. I mean, great things happen. I mean, that's yeah. What when you're sad or you know, everything is bad. You know, it's just the group of people that I partnership to do this brand are fantastic you know the same with the Matagoros in the American Republic these guys are family as well we're gonna get some stuff out in the future that uh, are gonna be a lot better but um, yeah wherever I go it have to be like that if it's not harmony in the in the ambience I'm out <laughs> moment there's stuff getting stuck getting you know uh, you have I mean when you do this kind of work I mean, in, in the meanwhile, you're working in all works, you have to separate your mind from the dollar. Mm. That's rule number one. You got to get profits and dollars out of your mind, and then you work in art. You know, that's my recommendation for any new guy who's coming to the business. Because when you're developing brands, separate your mind from the dollar and concentrate on your brands and your artworks and the company you run. But that's just going to make the difference. That's great. That's great. Aaron, anything else we have? I think we're set. All right. Santana, we want to thank you very, very much for being on the primetime show. Thank It's great to, uh, great, I said, great to have you on the show. It's, I know it's been a while. And you, you did great tonight, by the way. You say you're not mm -hmm. the best speaker. You did, you did fantastic. <laughs> um, and, um, you know, thank you again for the support you've given us over the years. Yes. Um, really, you've been, your support's been great. Um, and we, we're continuing to love to work with you, basically. Thank you, uh, Mr. Cooper. As always, it's a pleasure. You're an asset to this industry. Keep doing what you're doing. There's none better than you do what you're doing. Mr. Aaron, I like you because the way you are, you are unique. Very Thank honest. you. <laughs> <laughs> most, most people give Aaron the hate mail. Though. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right santana you take care uh and have a great night yeah, thank you. all right that Hi, is the, that is the one and only santana diaz of pure aroma cigars and what we'll do is we will now uh dive into a word from our sponsors um jerry tobacco the authentic Coro leaf is one of the most robust and flavorful leaves out there during the Golden Age of Cigar, it was, world, it was a leaf of choice to make some of the world's greatest cigars. Because it is one of the most challenging ones to cultivate, it fell out of favor by the 1990s. In the Hamastron Valley at Honduras, Julio Aroa took on the challenge of growing Corojo from the original seeds. And in 2000, he successfully reintroduced authentic Corojo back to the market. With over 50 years' experience in the tobacco business, from growing and curing tobacco to cigar production, the JRE Tobacco Farm has been able to continue to deliver products to market with authentic Corojo. Now with JRE Tobacco, Julio and his son Huso bring their very own brand to market, each containing the authentic Corojo leaf. Um, Aladino is a 100% authentic uh, Corojo Puro 
um, San Andreas Maduro, Ecuadorian Connecticut Shade, Habano or Cameroon wrapper representing the golden age of cigars from 1947 to 1961. Now available at your local retailer, be sure to ask for Jerry Tobacco, a legacy that is tasted in every drawer. And by Toscano Cigars, as rustic and strong as the people who smoke them, try Toscana's rustic and full-bodied flavors and aromas. Made in Italy with 100% dark fire cured tobacco from the United States and Italy, it's one of the best-selling cigars in the world. Toscano Cigars are the perfect combination of American and Italian craftsmanship. Whether in the traditional long format or the short format Toscanella, Toscano Cigars are dry cured, handmade, and fire cured for your enjoyment anytime, anywhere. Visit your local premium cigar retailer today and look for Toscano Cigars today. And by A.J. Fernandez Cigars. A.J. Fernandez's New World is named in the honor of discovery of tobacco by Christopher Columbus's expedition in 1492. Fernandez collaborated with his father, Ishmael, on a cigar which is comprised of a wrapper from Nicaragua that covers binder from the Jalapa Valley and a filler blend of Ometepe, Condega, and Esteli tobaccos. The core line debuted in 2014, and it was followed by New World Connecticut, New World Puerto Especial, and New World Cameroon. All four blends are able to captivate the palate of any cigar smoker. If you're beginning to discover the world of fine premium handmade cigars, New World Connecticut's for you. If you're into rich full body blend, Puerto Especial's for you. And if you're into the complex flavors, the New World Cameroon is for you. Finally, if you're into the robust and earthy flavors with notes of espresso, the New World Oscuro is definitely for you. Visit www.ajfcigars.com to learn more. And by M. Bombay Cigars. M. Bombay Cigars represent the most admired cigar culture of Cuba. They select the best of the best quality tobacco to use in the aging process. M. Bombay Cigars are enrolled in Costa Rica by some of the world's most experienced cigar oils, giving it a unique smoking experience. The band portrays the detailed and artistic nature of our small industry. Try M. Bombay, Gaia, M. Cuba, and the Esteli line. M. Bombay Cigars, where the cigar is a way of life. And finally, by Alec Bradley Cigars. You ever plunk down hard-earned cash for a cigar? You're hoping that you just bought yourself a nice drive to Taste Town only to discover you're in a slow lane with a clunker? That sucks. Say goodbye to bad rides. Test drive an Alec Bradley cigar today. At Alec Bradley, they get it. Whether we're talking about life or cigars, it's all about the ride. Learn more at alecbradley.com. So we're going to get into our Alec Bradley Live True segment, um, of course, sponsored by Alec Bradley. Um, this, uh, this game is a final now. Uh, the Mets have <laughs> beaten the Phillies 10-6. to and uh, if you're hearing beeping, it's uh, uh, it's probably Hector. It, it is Hector. Hector. It, it is Hector. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Hector. Thank you, Hector, very much. We we appreciate that. Uh, you know, I it's, <laughs> that's all I could say. Uh, by the way, uh, I guess uh, I want to welcome all the the basketball fans from Miami back. Um, following basketball again. <laughs> um, so uh, welcome back. Big win for the Heat there. And finally. We would like to thank the New York Islanders for their participation in the 2020 Stanley Cup playoffs as they were eliminated by the Tampa Bay Lightning. So there you go. It's Tampa Bay and Dallas in the Stanley Cup final. And I know you could care less about hockey. I think it's going to be a great matchup. So, all right. Uh, Aaron, just before we kind of get into this, a little audible here. Um, I know we're going to probably do some sort of a baseball show down the road, but what is your – just a little thought, I guess, on this whole – it looks like the baseball players are going to 16 games. Um, kind of interested in your thoughts on that. Um, I don't know. We'll have to see how it plays out this year, I guess, and get a feel for it. That, that's uh, kind of what I'm saying, too. I mean, it was nice when they expanded it uh, last time. I think it kind of uh, added a little bit of complexity to it, um, so that it may do the same again. But um, when you get so many teams involved, I think it just kind of waters it down a little bit. These these early round games are dangerous, though. Yeah, that's two out of three. I mean, you. I don't know how they're going to do it. Is it going to be first game on the road for the higher team, and then two games at home? That that's a bad. If, that, if they do it like that, I don't know how they're going to do it. Otherwise, unless they go back and forth twice. I wouldn't think they'd go back and forth twice, especially in you know this year with uh, exactly the you know health issues and stuff like that. So yeah, I mean that used to be a big argument with the baseball playoffs years ago because the the team with the better record used to play the first two games on the road mm -hmm. and they actually could come in going at home in, into an elimination game and, and with the best of five and people didn't like that. So, right. right. So, uh, so yeah, that's going to be interesting. What's the second round? Is it, it's best of five, right? I believe so. So yeah, it's going to be, so the thing I think where you're going to start to see this get um, criticized is, if you get a team like the Phillies who sneak in maybe um, with a 29 and 31 record and they, they, they get deep into the playoffs, then you're going to mm -hmm. have a, a below 500 team possibly playing in deep into the playoffs right now. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I don't know. I'm, I'm not as much as I, it may help the Phillies the next couple of years. I'm not really <laughs> loving it. Yeah. 
so um, we'll see what happens there. We'll see what happens there. But uh, I guess the A's right now are they're the three. They're in the three spot, right? Yeah, I think so. So yeah, it, you know, the question is, does the Yankees bounce back? So I guess we'll see. Yep. Yep. So Aaron, I wanted to um, I wanted to talk about the wildfires a bit uh, for this okay. segment. Um, because I don't know much about like these like these wildfires are not something we've we've seen to the extent in my area like in your area this is it, it, this is a big thing that's going on there right now i mean i saw the pictures of like the the red skies and stuff yeah what so I'm, i i know nothing about like i what what makes is it just dryness that you guys have out there why these fires are so like problematic like it seems like more and more they're becoming problematic yeah i mean in the summertime it gets very dry on the on, on the west um and that and when we talk i'm talking on the west i'm looking at you know you could pretty much include kind of anything from like colorado west i would say right and, and the entire you know from north to south at that point everything everything west but right. um yeah it just gets really dry during the summertime um there's you know and i know a lot of people like to think that you know california is just completely covered in homes and things like that and it's just you know there's lots of open space in california and in these other states so um it's just dry grass. Um, there's lots of forests and stuff as well. Um, and uh, you have to deal with various things. You can, you can have lightning strikes. You can have, uh, you know, power lines that kind of spark these things up. Um, and then you have humans, which always throw a wrench into things that can, uh, you know, people aren't as smart as they should be about, you know, fireworks. Uh, you know, I know a lot of pe people love to shoot off their fireworks and they complain about fireworks being illegal in lots of places, but, um, there's a lot of good reasons for, for doing that because, uh, you know, uh, a firework that is in the wrong direction can set off one of these fires very quickly. And it happens every year, multiple times and, wow. uh, they can get out of control like they, like they are now. Um, and, uh, you know, you get in a open area and, uh, you get a little bit of wind and it moves quick. Um, and you'll see, you know, you can see all up and down the West Coast, Arizona, Colorado, uh, all over the place. These fires just pick up and uh, it's really hard for the firefighters to contain them. Um, and, uh, you know, you have to work on creating fire lines. They have uh, jets that are dropping retardant all over the place, trying to kind of limit what's happening and things like that. But uh, once they get going, it's really hard to stop. Yeah, that was my next question. Why, why can't the firefighters just spray it out is it just because some of these are in locations that are difficult yeah these are in locations where there's, there's no fire hydrants really you know right. so you got tank trucks and things like that um or you got helicopters that are you know scooping up buckets of water out of you know reservoirs lakes whatever it is to try to dump on it and then you have large large jets that have been repurposed to carry lots of retardant to to drop on those fires or in uh, you know around the fire to try to help it from to keep it from spreading so um, yeah, it's not, they can't just run a hose out there and, and put these things out m many times. So, um, it's really, uh, working on creating, you know, fire breaks and stuff like that to try to, you know, contain the area that it can go, but it jumps, it can jump it very easily based on the wind and, and the conditions. I remember there was a round of fires, I want to say two or three years ago. Um, and it, it went into residential. That was when, um, oh, What's his? Why am I drawing a blank on his name? Brian Chinook. Brian Chinook, yeah, of Chinook Cellars. Yeah. He had his house actually destroyed from from one of them, right? Uh, he saved his house. That's right. He saved the house. Yeah. Yep. That's and right. uh, I saw Brian. I saw Brian in Napa the day of or day before that occurred. Um, and yeah, he had to kind of sneak through the 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 lines that the police had set up. Um, for people to get back to their homes because right. he wanted to go there to be at his house to try to do what he could to save it. And he was able to save the house, which, right. was, which was nice. But can they do anything like where these forest lines end what, that can stop the fire? Like, can they, I don't can they trench it or something like that? Uh, no, I mean, it, all it takes is an ember to blow, Across you know, the 50, 50 feet, 100 feet, whatever it is, and uh, it keeps going. Um and, uh, you know, up where Brian is, it's a lot of vineyards and open space and stuff like that. So, um, and you have homes kind of mixed in through that. And, uh, yeah, there's, 
it's it's unfortunate, but yeah, it gets into uh, residential areas and it can, you know, once a couple houses catch, that keeps spreading like that and it's it's a it's a bad time. Have you ever like have you ever been in a situation where it's been dangerously close to where you live? No. Um you know, where we're at there's there is open space, but it's mostly residential. Um so we've never really been in a spot where the fires have creeped, you know, dangerously close to us. Um, most of these fires are North of us and I live right on a, a river. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a, a, a fairly large gap between it, but it's never even reached, you know, kind of the other end of the other side of the river. So it's not gotten down that low, but um, I'd say, you know, there were some fires that this year that are happening probably I'd say maybe 30 miles North of where I'm at. Okay. Some large fires, things like that. So it hasn't been the fire, but it's been, the smoke has been uh, pretty intense. Um, you know, you're talking about the red skies and stuff like that. Yeah, that was uh, we had that here. Um, you know, you couldn't you couldn't see the sky. Um, the smoke was so thick; it was just blocking out everything. Um, the sky was just orange, um, and outside of those days, the smoke was still really thick. It was just really gray. Um, you know, still couldn't see the sky, anything like that. Um, luckily, yesterday and today, it's been clear. Um, so there's been, you know, enough wind to kind of move things around and stuff like that. Um, but, you know, the fires are still going. They're still working to try to get them fully contained. What, what causes the red sky? Is it just the, the light, like, reflecting on the smoke that's causing that? I, I think so, um, you know, because the sun is trying to get through. There's, you know, there could be days where there's no clouds, but the smoke is so thick that you just can't really get anything else in. So, yeah, you just get um, kind of sunlight, you know, trying to get through, but you just have it, you know, kind of uh, bouncing off all of the, the ash particles that are in the sky and uh, just really kind of, are, it's, a, it's, a weird, it's a weird kind of feeling seeing that kind of a look outside. You know, almost like you're on Mars, kind of. A, a yeah, I, I actually, yeah. I actually commented on trips with them. Like, it looked like the Martian sky when I when he yep, took that picture. Exactly he, like that. And yeah. he's he's up in Portland area, which is yeah, you know, yeah. And they're getting that. They're still struggling with it a lot. I mean, you know that the the games that were um, slated to play in Seattle, they've had to come down to San Francisco. They're going to have to go down to San Diego. The luckily the things the sky's supposed to clear up some, so I think they should be able to go back up uh, at the beginning of next week. But yeah. um yeah, just to, yeah, part of it is you're just at the mercy of the direction of the wind as well. So it's yeah. Yeah, kind of how that plays out. Does it get to a point where, I mean, I know this year it's completely different with like COVID, but do they start canceling schools? I mean, when did, when, did they, when, did it kind of, when did it affect like jobs, going into work and schools? Did it ever get to that point? Um, not really, just you kind of shelter in place kind of a thing where you need to be inside. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, they'll tell you to like, you know, try to block up, block any gaps like in the doors and windows and things like that to try to prevent smoke from getting into the, the houses or the businesses and things like that. So right. um, I think unless you're in real, like actual danger of the fire being there, um, there's no evacuations or anything like that. Okay. All right. That's interesting. Yeah. Like I said, it's, it's, it's kind of something I don't like, we, you know, it's a, it's a world I don't know about with that. I've just not, you know, I've actually been in an earthquake. I've been in a tornado. I actually haven't been in an eye of a hurricane, but, yeah. uh, but, uh, so I've actually experienced both, but I've never experienced the wildfire thing. So it's kind of something that's a completely different animal to me. Yeah. It's, um, yeah. In California, we get, you know, fires and, uh, earthquakes. So it's not really things that you can like really, you don't get a, a bit of a warning yet. I mean, fires a little bit, you can kind of get a feel for, you know, how fast it's moving and things like that, but um, it's not really things you can plan for too well. Yeah. I was in the DC earthquake and it was the only earthquake I've ever experienced. And I knew something was up. Like, yeah. and I turned and I was with a guy who was from uh, the West coast, actually. Uh, we were doing a, uh, we were just meeting. It was a meeting of uh, us and a business partner and a customer. And he was from the West coast. And I just turned to him. I said, and he says, yes, it's an earthquake. He knew I was going to ask him right away. <laughs> He's like, we, and we have to get out of here because it was a chemical company we were in. So oh, we, yeah. had to, we had to get out of there right away. Definitely. Um, yeah. And then there was damage. Like this, this had structural damage, this, this earthquake. It was, oh yeah. Yeah. So yeah, cause they're not really, they, you know, they don't have, a, I don't think a strict uh, protocols in regards to building for earthquake, you know, no, resistance no, they, and stuff like that. So. No, and I was it was it was just outside DC in Maryland. We were very close to the epicenter of that thing. Yeah. Um so it was yeah, so like so I did experience and I had a tornado we had a tornado hit when I lived in New Jersey. We had we had damage and that's another weird thing you'll see. 
Um, right. But uh, as far as it's weird because as far as hurricanes go, I've never had hurricane impacts even in because I'm far west. When I lived in New York, you don't really get hurricane. You get the you get the rains basically. Sometimes you get a little wind. Um, yeah. But so that so I've not like experienced the eye of a hurricane where I've had a board up like people in Miami there. Right. Yeah. So I, I, I thought it was kind of an interesting topic because yeah. like I didn't know much about it. I said, well, I figured we'd hit it and tell our sure. audience about it. Yeah. All right. Uh, anything else we want to hit on that? Or we can get into the last segment there. Yeah, let's go for it. All right. So let's uh, do the last round of uh, things from our sponsors. Uh, uh, Dumbarton Tobacco and Trust. With Dumbarton Tobacco and Trust, Master Blender Steve Saka set out to create Puro Son Compromiso. Cigars without compromise. This represents an expression of Saka's cozy values and attests in three simple words everything Saka wants to accomplish. Cigars are more than a passion of Saka, they are a way of life. Ask for the brands of Dumbarton Tobacco and Trust, Sober Mesa, Mi Carita, Umagog, Moisture to Saka, Total Sosius, and Sin Compromiso at your local tobacconist. And by La Aurora Cigars, in the heart of Santiago Dominican Republic, on the rolling floor at La Aurora Cigar Factory, is a section reserved only for the elite. The best of the best. These elite cigar rollers work for over 10 years to simply get the opportunity to make a historic cigar. Those cigars are the La Aurora Preferitos, featuring six different wrappers that are beautifully packaged, perfecto shape. La Aurora Preferitos have been the preferred cigar of the Leon family for 115 plus years. Take part in a legendary tradition that started the Dominican cigar industry. Look to the lion. La Aurora Cigars, we are Dominican defined. And by J.C. Newman Cigar Company. Founded in 1895 by Julius Caesar Newman, J.C. Newman Cigar Company is the oldest family-owned premium cigar maker in America. For four generations and 124 years, J.C. Newman has been handcrafting many of the world's finest cigars. J.C. Newman is headquartered in an iconic 109-year-old plus factory in the Ybor City Historic National, Ybor City National Historic Landmark District of Tampa, Florida. At this factory known as El Rahul, J.C. Newman rolls premium cigars by hand and hand-operated antique cigar machines. The J.C. Newman Pensa Factory is the second largest in Nicaragua, and it's a brick house, Pearl de Mar, El Baton, Quorum, and Yagua cigars are hand-rolled. J.C. Newman's Diamond Crown, Maximus Julius Caesar, and Black Diamond cigars are handmade by tobacco at A. Fuente in the Dominican Republic. With its longtime partners, the Arturo Fuente family, the Newmans have founded the Cigar Family Charitable Foundation, which supports low-income families in the Dominican Republic with education, healthcare, vocational training, and clean water. Visit jcnewman.com to learn more. And by Casa Cuevas Cigars. The Cuevas family has five generations of ex experience of cigar making. For many years, they have manufactured cigars for many industry leaders at a Las Lavas factory in the Dominican Republic. Now the Cuevas family has brought their very own brand to market with Casa Cuevas Cigars. Tired of Casa Cuevas Connecticut, the Casa Cuevas Abano, Casa Cuevas Maduro, as well as the Cuevas Reserver line. If they don't carry it, be sure to ask your local retailer for Casa Cuevas Cigars. Casa Cuevas Cigars from our casa to yours. And finally, by Adventura Cigars. Adventura the Explorer is the first creation by Marcel Noble and Henderson Ventura. Immediately after lighting up the Explorer, the Mexican rapper will delight the aficionado with its dark chocolate flavor. After a while in pleasure, the Dominican filler will flatter the aficionado's palate with wonderful spicy and leather aromas and unite it with the wooden sweetness from Ecuador. Try Adventura the Explorer and explore the wonderful experience. So welcome back. Um, Aaron, I kind of put this one together tonight, and I was again. I'm trying to come up with some some different things tonight for the deliberation segment, right? And this is kind of one I think I I think we may have explored this one years ago on Stogie Geeks, right? But I put a new one together, and this is kind of like what I call practices by retailers. Some of these retailers may have members' lounges with it, mm -hmm. um, and I'm I'm calling them practices. I'm not necessarily saying they are best practices, sure. um. And I came, I was going to do 10. I came up with nine. So I think it's, but some of these are multifaceted. And, you know, I see a lot of retailers, they get into certain patterns and they do things, whether it's coming to events or promotions. Um, and I kind of want to just debate some of these and see what we think, if they're good or bad right now. Sure. All right. The first one I, I hit right off the bat is pipes. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm talking, I'm not talking about a, a pipe store. Okay. I'm talking about, a place that's primarily a cigar place right. that wants to get into pipes. Right. Right. And I see, I see, I see cigar places do this. They have um, pipe nights and maybe mm -hmm. they'll try to push a pipe at, at a cigar shop. What are your opinions on that? Um, I think if there's a good uh, kind of pipe community in the area, it's, it's a good thing to do. Um, especially if the shop is looking to kind of get into that area. Um, you know, it can bring people that might normal, not normally go to that location into there. 
and uh, if they like the ambiance of the location, and maybe it's something that they'll visit a little bit more. Um, yeah, I think if there's a good community for it, um, and you can, uh, you're not like putting off the cigar smokers um, that are your normal clientele, um, then it would be good to do it. I've seen I've seen this happen at several stores in Charlotte. We have a couple of really good pipe stores in Charlotte, right? So I'm going to kind of take them out of the equation. There's a place called McCraney's uh, mm -hmm. in Charlotte. They're, they're really known for their pipes. more than They have a scar humidor, a good one, but they're known for their pipes. But I'm talking about ones that maybe they, don't, they just don't do pipes on a regular basis. And mm -hmm. this is what I see happen. This is the pattern that I see happen. I think you're 100% right what you say, but this is what happens. They have like a pipe night. And yep. they get a lot of interest, right? Mm -hmm. And I, I'll be honest, I learned about pipes through going to a pipe night. And yep. I, do I, I only smoke a pipe maybe a few times a year. Right. I'm not really big into it. It's just not my thing. Um, but I see basically they'll sell some pipes that night. Maybe they'll sell, and maybe they'll sell some pipe tobacco. Mm -hmm. But after that, it just dies off. Right. And I don't, I don't know if they've kind of gained anything from it. I don't see a lot of companies, uh, retailers – Again, if they're not primarily pipe retailers, I don't see them push this after, and I see this kind of die out afterwards, what happens. Yeah. I, I haven't seen a, a, a cigar-centric shop become a pipe shop yet. It's like if right. there's one from the beginning, and that's what they're known for, they're out, but that's kind of where I see it. So I kind of see it sometimes as a, more of a miss in the end. And I don't know how much money they make on the pipe night. You know, maybe on the mm – -hmm. I think on the – pipe tobacco, I don't think you make much off. Right pipes in general i think that's where they they make the money sure i do see at the trade show pipes like when i don't know if you know the retailers who do pipes the pipe the pipe booths are very crowded the first day yeah the first day people are looking for the that that one pipe that they want to have or yeah you know, they, you know things like that so yeah yeah it's definitely a big draw yeah but do you do you smoke a pipe at all or no i'm about the same as you i'll i'll break it out a few times a year yeah. um you know, I love the smell of, of pipe tobacco. I love the smell of smoke from the pipe. Um, it's just, uh, you know, I, I know the people that smoke it all the time will tell you that it's not a lot of work, but it's a, it's a fair amount of work. You know, it's a little bit of babysitting and stuff like that. Um, really easy to get tongue bite um, if you're not doing it, you know, on the regular. So, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, it, it it's a bit of a curiosity, I guess, but uh, it's not like a in-depth thing that I get into but I look I I would I would much rather sit in a in a lounge with a bunch everybody smoking pipes than in a lounge if everybody smoking cigars just yeah. for the, the the aroma of the room yeah. <laughs> yeah and I got yeah exactly and I have to he's already chatting in the chat room uh big Scott's the guy who introduced me to pipes okay uh, yeah so he did it and he he did a great job at pipe night he used to do a really good job at pipe night and he was a guy who would push the pipes afterwards Mm -hmm. um which i think was really good and a lot of a lot of the we the shop he worked at was outland and then he you know there was a members lounge and he would have a lot of that residual pipe smoking in there afterwards so right he would he did a really good job with it so he wasn't one of the guys i'm, I'm talking about with this he he would really get behind it. he loved his pipes yeah he, he he kind of taught me the basics too nice so uh yeah i gotta give him credit on that all right here's the next one ladies nights mm. what are your opinion on ladies nights I, I would kind of put it in the same kind of group as the pipe night. Um, <clears throat> if you don't have uh, a large number of ladies that have interest, um, it's going to be uh, probably not the best. And then you have to determine how it's laid out. Is it ladies only so that, you know, guys are not welcome kind of a thing, or if it's a mix, if you have a bunch of guys and you have two ladies, they're going to feel like they're a little intimidated, I think, or the guys are just going to be, overbearing, uh, you know, trying to talk to, talk to them or, you know, sh try to, you know, tutor them on cigars and things like that. So, um, I think it depends on how, how it's kind of presented and, uh, how the event, uh, goes. I agree. Um, I think the other thing that happens, and this is where I've seen it work well, and I agree most cases, it's tough to get it to work well is if you have a group of lady cigar smokers, if you build a community out of it. Um, David Jones, a friend of the show, he, he mm -hmm. used to work at Burns Tobacco. They did an incredible job building up late, their lady. They had a lady cigar smokers group out of Chattanooga. I think they're still mm -hmm. there. These are hardcore cigar smokers. 
right. but you have to try to build that community up with there right yeah. now. And that's, that's where it gets difficult. And I know a lot of the member lounges that I've seen in North Carolina, because they're private, they can exclude women. Sure. And that's a contra and it's always been controversial about letting women into the lounge because on one hand, uh, people don't want women. Like, if, if you'd be surprised. There's a group of people that don't want women there. Right. Want to get away yep. from their wives. Yep. And then there's the other group of some of the younger guys who want women there and, sure. you know, and it, it changes the whole vibe of it as well. Um, yeah. I mean, um, if you think of it as just trying to be a cigar smoker community and it should be pretty much welcome to welcoming to everyone. Right. Yeah. Um, there's no, there's nothing that says that, you know, women don't know about cigars and they can't smoke cigars and things like that. I understand the, the, some of the aspect of, you know, you want to kind of, um, you know, private lounge, kind of a guy's night kind of a thing. I can understand those types of things if you want to do it like that, but to be completely unwelcoming to women smokers, I think is, you know, the, the wrong, the wrong way to do it. Yeah. We had this guy, um, he just passed away recently. This guy, Bill, 90 year old person. Um, at the, the the store, the shop I smoke at now, some some ladies came in, and he just shot his mouth off like, <laughs> I should be home making dinner and stuff. Like, yeah, oh yeah. my goodness, like it was bad. It was, and he's ninety years old. And lucky the women who did this recognized he was ninety years old. Um, right. But we, uh, the owner wasn't there, and we actually did tell the owner, hey, you know, he did make a bunch of people feel uncomfortable. That yeah, day. you yeah. know, if if you're in a public lounge. They have every right to be in there as much as, 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 as I do. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the private club thing I get, that's a different angle, and that's mm-hmm. a debatable thing for sure. But, yeah. Um, but I have seen it. Like I said, the Chattanooga group um, is probably the most – I think there's one in Wisconsin that's pretty big too um, as far as, as lady smokers go. Yeah. Charlotte's got a really good well, – Bob Charlotte's got a really passionate uh, community of women smokers that's been building over the past few years. Scott nice. probably doesn't even notice because he's left – he's not in Charlotte anymore. It's it's the landscape's changed a lot right mm-hmm. now. There's a really uh, we were talking to um, um, last week when we were talking to Kevin and Juan. Their rep was one of those smokers. Okay, uh, and, and she now she's a rep for them. So um, nice. yeah, like I said, so they they do a, they, they there's a really like Charlotte. It took a while for it to build, and I think it kind of built outside the retailer community. To be honest with you, I think it just happened. Right, social media and people getting together. Okay, yeah, all right. So you're launching a cigar. Okay, mm-hmm. at an event, um, and I want to kind of go through a couple of scenarios. Do you think it's good to bring some sort of exclusive cigar for that event, right? That maybe you, not. I'm not talking about an event only cigar, but a cigar that you, you you're not going to get anywhere else, right? Or do you think that you it's better to do a true national launch of a cigar, kind of what Abe did tonight with the Crema de Laranja, first time launching it, um. What do you think it's just overrated in general? I mean, I think if you, if the, um, the brand and the retailer, uh, have a synergy and they feel like it's a good move to kind of do that as a, um, unique one-off thing, I think it can work. Um, but there's some times where maybe that retailer can't push the brand hard enough for a launch for what the brand was looking to do. Um, and it could definitely be a detriment. Um, cause you know, you get this cigar launched through this one retailer you can't get it from them they don't ship something like that you know it can definitely be a bit of a, a wet blanket over a over a launch i think yeah we i agree with you on that the problem is i've seen like some of these national launches aren't really national launches like mm-hmm. the, the cigars are already out like and that used to happen at the cigar dave events in charlotte mm-hmm. like they promote this thing as hey this is the national debut of this cigar right. and it never was the case. The cigar mm-hmm. maybe was debuting for the retailer sponsoring cigar. Day, right. And it maybe was broadcast on the radio, but it really wasn't a national launch there. Yeah. Uh, I, I can say that, um, you, like Stace Berkland, you know, I think, you know, yep. him. we've, we've actually taken road trips for some true national launches though. Right. Um, the one I remember in particular that we did was we went to Burns because La Serena was, uh, was, was launching a new cigar there. The mm-hmm. Merlion. And that was a true national launch. I mean, that thing was right. an, er, an early release. If you got there, you know, you were going to be able to get that cigar. And it, like we drove six hours to go there because mm-hmm. uh, we were big La Serena fans. And, um, you know, it doesn't, it, it was actually, they do great events at Burns. And that was where I first met Dave, actually. 
was that right. um so those i think were that i kind of miss some of that i don't think you see as much of that anymore sure. i don't think people take road trips as much anymore i think the launches are just different with that yeah right i i'll agree with you on that one okay next one you have a members lounge mm-hmm. and the lounge wants to have a member sponsored event right where they want members to kind of make the event happen uh like a potluck dinner uh movie night yeah um what are your thoughts on that should should the members be doing that or should that maybe be the store doing that um i th- this goes again to the to the members but um i think it could be pretty cool um if you do a like a members driven event um like a, especially if you want to do a potluck or something like that um a lot of cigar smokers I know are very much into like uh, barbecue, smoking, eats, all that kind of stuff. So if you do something like that where you're, you know, everybody's kind of preparing something and bringing it in, you get to try a lot of different stuff. I think that could be fun. Um, if you want to do a movie night, uh, you know, getting everybody to agree on a movie or whatever might be a little tough challenge or something like that. But um, I could see how it would be, you know, if if the if the members are – you know, kind of have that community feel to it. I think it could be done pretty well. And I don't think, you know, I understand that, uh, you know, the retailer would normally be putting on an event, but um, yeah, if you've got an, a, a nice group of people, then I, I don't see any reason why you couldn't do something like that. No, I, 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 I agree with that. And like uh, big Scott's in the room again. And uh, a couple of the ones he was involved with um, were really good. There was an Italian night where mm-hmm. they convinced one of the members wives to, to cook all the food and we contributed mm-hmm. money to it. Mm-hmm. Um, the owner actually stepped up and got some of the reps to give us cigars that night. There you go. Which was that was a great thing to do. Um, he he did that. So we had cigars to smoke that night. Mm-hmm. Um, the same thing. I know we did. Uh, we did the same thing with God. We did Godfather movie. We did Clint Eastwood night. Kind of the same thing. And uh, I like it when at least the owner steps in and kind of. You always have, you should clear it with the owner. I mean, it's always yeah. A oh, yeah. 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 Um, and the second thing is I like when the owner kind of puts a stake in it saying, Hey, you know what? I'm going to support it here that night. Um, he was always looking for more sales this, this particular one too, but that's, right. that's every retailer is going to do that. So, you know, I always thought those were, I think they're good things as well. There's certain lounges. I don't think it would work well in mm-hmm. like one that comes to mind is like Havana Phil's Davidoff lounge. I don't think you can do that there. It's a right. different vibe is what I'll yeah. say, but in a more intimate lounge, I think it works. Yeah, and if you have a lounge uh, that doesn't have a bar, um, if you did like a bottle sharing or a kind of a tasting type of thing with, uh, you know, various liquor and stuff like that, um, that would be a good that would be a good thing as well. If you if you've got a group of people that are into into that kind of a thing. Yeah, I I agree. I I totally agree with that. Yeah, too. I mean, yeah, people would uh you could bring your own it's BYOB in the lounges in the private lounges in Charlotte mm-hmm. too, so you could do that. Um as well so i think they also would sometimes bring in liquor sponsors too to the old outland yeah to do that yeah so i I agree with you on that one they they were fun things they were there's some of the ones that those are things i miss Mm -hmm. i I do miss those types of events they were really good yeah all right now here's a controversial one you're a member of a cigar lounge you're a paying member but you have to pay a ticket for an event that night in your lounge um i think that's okay uh, if it's for special events, um, like there's some around here that do like um, Halloween parties or Christmas parties and things like that. And those will be ticketed events. And depending on like um, these lounges typically have like different tiers for membership and things like that. So uh, like if you're at the top tier, you might get uh, a free ticket um, and only have to pay if you wanted to bring a guest. Um, or if you were next tier down, you paid, you know, half price for a ticket or something like that. And so if they want to do something like that and there's um uh, you know, unique, um, things that the event is going to bring, uh, like, you know, food or, uh, you know, additional cigars or whatever. I, I could see how it can work. Um, I don't think that just because you're a member, you're, um, you know, you get everything for free kind of a thing. Um, you know, when they do have an event. So I, I, I think it's okay to have, you know, special ticketed events. That's a controversial one here. And it really comes down <laughs> to the price point of the membership. Right. It, yeah, it, sure. It, there are some membership lounges where you are paying hundreds of dollars. Um, and then there was a ticketed event. And basically, if you wanted to be in the lounge that night, you had to have a ticket, whether you wanted right. to be part of the event or not. Sure. That's where it's got now. 
I've seen it when you look at the membership agreements, right? Mm-hmm. If you read the fine print in a lot of them, it will say they can do that. Yeah, no that's, one, no if that's already them. in the if that's already in the agreement that you signed up for, and right. your membership says that there are going to be X number of nights during the year that you don't have free reign over the lounge because there will be private events that you can participate in at an additional yeah. cost. I don't see anything wrong with it. Yeah. Now, Alan Rubin made a good point. If it, if if the if the ticket comes with a cigar and a drink, um, mm-hmm. there's something about that that's good. I I think the hybrid way to do that is basically. Don't don't kick anyone out that night. Um, but if you want the amenities of the event, buy the ticket. And I think sure. you know, and I think I, lounge. I've seen a lot of lounges do that. I think that's that you know this way the member is not excluded that night. Um, and, and and I think it's um I think it's okay in that case. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think like 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 Aaron goes up to Havana Phil's like that's how they've worked their events. I think that's a good way to do it. Um, as well. Yeah. Um, you get a, you, you buy the ticket and then you go cash the, you, you take your ticket, it gets you the drink, it gets you the cigar and, yep. and I'm okay with it like that. Some yeah. of them, again, with some of the smaller, more intimate lounges, this has been a problem. It, okay. It's definitely, it's definitely been a problem. Um, especially Super Bowl is always a controversial one. Uh, when it's ticketed for the Super Bowl, that's. Always, <laughs> yeah. That's- but like I said, uh, you have to, you have to offer something, uh, above and beyond, I think to ask for additional money. Right, but then you know. can you say, but but yeah, but when you say you ha- the only way you could be in the lounge, you're paying an additional fifty dollars for that night. And a lot of if it's want- if it's set up that way up front, then I think it's okay. But if yeah. you if there's nothing in the agreement and all that stuff, and you pretty much you know you have access during business hours as a member, then yeah, that's yeah. there's there could be a problem. Yeah, like I said, this was a problem with our old lounge uh, that Scott used to work at. It was a mm-hmm. huge problem because it wasn't. It was kind of forced down. Is right. what happened, and it was a problem. Well, Scott's gonna think I'm doing a retrospective. <laughs> <laughs> Here's the next one, and this is an interesting one: allowing non-members in a cigar lounge for. And I'm gonna change this. In any case, cigar event or non-cigar event. Okay. What are your feeling about non-members being in the lounge? Um. So if it's not if it's not for an event, uh-huh. um. If the lounge is uh, a perk of being a paid member and you're letting someone in that doesn't um, pay and it's just kind of a regular day or whatever it is, I can see why you would have maybe have an issue with it because you're paying to, for access to it and somebody that uh, doesn't pay for access to it is there. Now, if, it, if the um, shop wants to do a few of these events every year where – they want to have kind of an allowing non-members in so they can get a chance to see what the lounge is like, to see if they can recruit new members. That's cool. I think that's a good – obviously, it's good, it's good for the, the lounge's business to try to increase membership, right? Yeah. So I think it's okay to do that. Um, but I don't think you want to have it on a regular basis because then you're, you may be eliminating some of the reasons for becoming a member in the first place if the other, if the other perks aren't good enough to, to make you think that there's value in, in the membership. Um, for events, um, I'd be okay with it, but I think you have to set it up the right way. If, um, you know, if there's a limited amount of whatever it is for the event there, I think you have to give members first shot because if there's a limited amount, you don't want a bunch of non-members rolling through and kind of, you know, poach it, everything that's there for it. And the members kind of get left holding the bag without getting a shot to buy what they wanted. So, um, I think if they get first shot at that stuff, then it's okay. And then non-members, if there's stuff left over, non-members, ha- you know, have kind of free reign to purchase whatever's remaining. Yeah, I like the option of a day pass, mm-hmm. as long as it's a reasonable price thing. Like sure. Don't don't gouge it. Um, yeah. If it's reasonable, hey, you 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 buy this cigar and and uh, for an extra few dollars, you get a ticket into the lounge for that night. Um, yeah. Or if you buy X amount of dollars, you get free entrance kind right. of a thing. Yeah. You get free. It shows it off. I think yep. with an event, I've seen it work well. Um, where I remember when Manuel Casada came for a Manuel uh, Casa Magna event, no, uh, and everyone came to see Manuel. They opened mm-hmm. the lounge up that night, and they they recruited a ton of members after that. Yeah. So it, it it does do it. Um, I think when you get someone who's the the issue is sometimes you bring a guest. It's the issue: can you bring a guest? Right. And that's where it gets a little sticky because then if you're bringing the guest all the time, there's got to be a point where you say. You can't bring this guest like you can't bring your son in every time. Like if you if your son's coming in every time as a guest, <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
you got to buy them. You know, so I, I think you got to, there's got to be some discretion used by the owner of the store with that. Right. I've, seen, I've seen that happen. Um, Mark, Mark Foley, I think you may remember, he's a guy who works yeah. at the cigar shop. We had him on a Terrence show years ago. Mm-hmm. He had a really unique concept. He came up with a Myrtle, Myrtle Beach, which is a very transient type of community, right? And he set up a locker program, right, for, for people. You could rent a locker for a week, and it gave you access to his lounge. There you go. Um, it was very reasonable. It was like, I think it was 50 bucks for the week. And, you know, you could keep your cigars there. You could come in close as any member. Um, and he got a lot of business that way. Uh, they had a few lockers that they would put aside, you know, to just basically you, you rent it. And if you didn't want the locker, I guess it was the same thing. You got like a week pass or something like that. Yeah. Um, because that community was really good with that. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Next one. Free, now, a lot, of these, a lot of these lounges, what they do is if you buy a tier of membership, mm-hmm. they will give you cigars each month in your locker. Sure. And the, the thing is, I've seen it where it's done two ways. I've seen it where the retailer will put some cigars from his inventory in the lockers. Mm-hmm. Then I see him basically put the IPCPR cigars in that he's not going to bring in. <laughs> and, and um and, and or um get free stuff from the reps again we're probably in the idea you're not going to bring it in mm-hmm. good thing or bad thing i have i have mixed feelings on that one too i think there's some benefits with that yeah i mean i think it's okay um if you know if you if the membership kind of leads to you know each month you're going to get x number of cigars put in your locker that's cool i mean it's part of the membership um so that's no problem um if it's cigars that are not carried in the lounge, however the lounge owner acquires them is is fair game. Um, if it's a way to kind of uh, check the temperature of the membership in regards to those cigars to determine if he wants to bring them in or not, absolutely use that use that as your kind of like polling situation for for doing that. Um, if it's free cigars on the trade show, again, it's you know maybe just a perk of uh, membership. Maybe there's uh, certain guys that uh, are friends with the owner and that's one of the things they do that that's cool too. I mean, um, I think we've, we've talked to definitely Sock has said it and many others have said it, I think is, um, uh, if they don't want to give, give out cigars for free, they just, they can say no. So they don't, you know, they're not, they're not tied to giving out free cigars to people. So, um, they can do it. And I think once that, once it's, uh, changed hands and it's in the owner's hands, you can do what you want with them. Here's what I would go with that. Um, I would say if you're going to do it, even if you're not carrying the brand, and even if it's a trade show sample, like obviously disclose that. But bring in something, maybe do it where get the members to smoke it and see if maybe it has something you should carry. I mean, use it to your advantage, mm-hmm. I would say, with that. Yeah. Um, but put a cigar in there that you at least maybe smoked before and, and like is, you think your members are going to like. Uh, I, the problem is I've seen some some shops put some really shitty cigars in there, mm-hmm. uh, like like unbanded, fresh rolled. <laughs> like you know, you put something in there. That I think, like I said, try to use it to your advantage to build a business, and maybe someone's gonna get hooked on the cigar, and they'll carry it in the humidor at some point. You know, yep. so, I think, I, so I don't think it's a bad thing. I would just say do it right. Don't don't cheapen it. You know, if you're gonna do it, like say you know what, you'll get fifty dollars of cigars, and these are what these cigars retail for. Right. Um, you know, it, it just I would also try to put something that maybe is I'm not saying don't put an unknown brand in there, but put something in that maybe has some tr- legs, you know, in yeah. there too. Yeah. Um maybe it's a line that maybe it's a brand you carry and it's a line you don't carry, something like that. Mm-hmm. Um but I, I've seen some real dog rockets put in there for mm-hmm. the sake like there was no way these cigars were gonna be liked by anyone. It was just kinda yeah. like I, I gotta I gotta put that in there. Yeah, you don't want to just do put filter cigars kind of in there as something as a, you know, you think you're giving it as a perk, but the members don't see it that way. Yeah. Yep. All right. Number eight. This is my favorite one. (laughs) Multiple TVs in a lounge Mm -hmm. that all have the same sport on it. The same thing. So the same game or just like four TVs, four baseball, four different baseball games. Let's go the same thing like golf. (laughs) <laughs> okay like nascar I mean, like because i think there's something with football it's a different story in baseball it's a different when you have different ones i think that's different yeah um yeah i think um i think it's okay if somebody makes a request for something different right um i think it's okay um i think where you kind of get tied in is hey 
uh, Joe Blow's chair uh, faces this TV, <laughs> and uh, he wants to watch that. Um, and then you have to, to kind of deal with how the the lounge deals with something like that. But um, I don't think it's f necessarily fair to have, you know, kind of dominate the lounge with a, a single th event. Um, if you have people that are interested in su some different stuff, you right. know, um, if your all your regulars are in there to watch the golf tournament and they want the sound off of the golf tournament, let that be the dominant TV with the sound, right. but let somebody else watch the baseball game or watch the horse race or whatever it is with the sound off. And, you know, give them the opportunity to be into something that they're into. Um, I don't think you want to try to turn anyone away from enjoying their time in the lounge if you can help it. I agree. I agree. Now, this is – I got in a little trouble with this because we would uh, go in the lounge watch football on Sundays. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the main TV is going to be the Panthers. I have to right. – it's look, that's a home team. Most of the people are fans mm -hmm. there, especially when their season ticket holders, they watch the road games there. I'm not going to win that one, <laughs> but I'd always need all that second TV for the giant game. Yeah, sure. Well, you know, after a while I had a couple people say, Hey, <laughs> right. yeah. enough. So, so I kind of got a little call and I, and I, and I understood. It. I said, no, you're right. Yeah. You know, it's a, uh, you know, I said, especially when the Giants started really sucking, it became, it became a little more of an issue. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so, um, what I've said, what we've, I think what we used to do with that and even still though is, if someone's not, if look, what we say is we put, you put the game on, maybe someone's watching, but if a few people come in and say, Hey, you want to watch this game or you, you want to switch it off to something. I think that's kind of like, it's kind of like a gentlemanly thing to do that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, now with the seats, that's a problem, right? Yeah. Cause people like, I, I I'm guilty of having a, a regular seat. Right. Right. But <laughs> some people are really protective of that seat. Yeah. Okay. There was some members, I remember Super Bowl games, they were coming in like at, 10 in the morning, putting their stuff there, leaving for four hours and coming. <laughs> that stuff you don't do. Right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, and that was a problem. That was a big problem with, with people you wouldn't expect to do that. Right. Um, so again, you know, if I know someone's there, you know, and I'm in that seat, I, I, Hey, you want, you want the seat. Um, I know it's in, in, you know, again, just kind of use common sense there, but that meant, I tell you, some people who run the lounges take a lot of shit with that too. It's a, it's a, especially with yeah, the, the I, guests I in it. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, and the last one, and this is, I'll call this the, uh, the Dave Garofalo question, because mm -hmm. I've heard him address this one. Allowing cigars in a lounge that are not purchased at that store. Maybe not, I'm not saying they don't carry it, but not purchased. So it could be a cigar they carry, but it wasn't purchased there. I would say it's up to the lounge's discretion. They have every right to tell you that you need to buy stuff there. Um, and if those are the rules of the store, you got to follow the rules of the store. It's not your store. It's the owner's store. So yeah. um, if they say you have to buy it there, that's the rules, man. Right. You just got to follow the rules. Yeah. Um, so, but if they're, if they're open to it and, you know, you, you buy a couple cigars there, but you choose to put them away and you bring out some cigars that you brought and the lounge is okay with that free game i think you just go you have to just go based on the the rules of the lounge yeah no I, I i agree with that um dave takes the approach dave's rule is no but that's dave's rule right that's dave's rule now yep. if some owner wants to say um don't bring the cigars in you know you have to you look it has to be cigars we carry at least that or hey you, we, we want you to purge to purchase those cigars there mm -hmm. um I, for example, this is where I've seen it get a little – like, I've seen Ezra Zion cigars being smoked in, in, a, in a retail store. You know, right. like, it's, you know, some of the, the goofy stuff. And, and that's where I just say that's a little too much because those are, bought, those are direct to consumer for the most part. That, yeah. it's, just, it's not cool to do that. But I think that's up to the lounge owner. Set what the rule is. And, I mean, there was one guy in Charlotte. He, this guy was nuts. He, um, he would pull things out of the locker – of people it, oh yeah, that's, not yeah good. that's really bad i mean yeah um i can understand not smoking a cuban cigar and i, I can mm -hmm. but i think it, again it's up to the lounge owner and, and if, if you're going to be the guy to pull the cigars out of a locker then put that in your membership agreement you know hey if we'll, we'll audit your locker you're, you're at risk there. i don't think it's a good thing to do i wouldn't recommend that yeah i mean if the lounge is really easy going about it um i think that etiquette is pretty much just you know kind of buy like for like uh, for what you're going to be smoking there. So if you plan to smoke two cigars in the lounge and you brought two cigars with you, buy two cigars. 
Yeah. Um, just kind of, you know, that's, I think that's the right thing to do. You, you know, they're, they're not there just for a, a free place for you to sit and smoke. Um, you know, they have to keep the lights on and pay the employees and all that stuff. So um, I think that's just the proper etiquette in regards to if they, ha if they're leaning towards that type of thing. Yeah. Or if you buy a box, like I don't have a problem if you buy the box, put the lock box in your locker, you bought the box at that store. Yeah. Uh, again, I wouldn't feel right about bringing a CI box in there. It just, it sure. just, it feels wrong. Now I'm guilty. I've had shops let me smoke samples from time to time in there. I, I try not to abuse it. Right. Um, I've, I've started to get away from it more because I can't really review it there anyway, but sometimes yeah. I will do that. But that causes a problem because then people are going to ask what you're smoking and stuff. And it puts, it's putting the retail in a bad position. So I've tried to get away from that. Yeah. You know, it's not fair to the, even though it's private and they didn't have a rule against it. I, I don't right. want to put anyone in a bad position. And as far as Dave's position, I respect Dave's because that's Dave's choice to do that. Um, if that's his rule, then you, you follow the rules. I'll smoke somewhere else. You know, I, yep. I, I respect the, it's, it's going into someone's home and respect it. Yep, exactly. All right. So those, are, those were the things I had. Nice. Yeah. All right. All right. Um, kind of um, wrapping up uh, next week, uh, Dylan Austin, the president of Davidoff Cigars, will be our special guest. Nice. Primetime episode 157. Yep. So uh, that's going to be a very interesting interview. So I've mm -hmm. never interviewed Dylan before. Uh, no. So I think it's going to be a good show. So I think yep. uh, stay tuned for that one. Um, and then the week after we're still kind of, fill we have some stuff filled in October already, but next week, the week after we're still trying to fill that up right now. Yep. All right. Um, anything else, Aaron? Nope. I think we're all set. All right. All right. Thanks to our audience for tuning in. Um, as always, uh, do appreciate it. Thanks to Santana Diaz, our special guest as well. And that's going to wrap up primetime episode 156 into the annals of history for this Thursday, September 17th. Now Friday, September 18th on the East Coast. And if Cigar Coop publishes today, we will have our 3,000th consecutive day of publishing. Mm. I got to hope that article. Congratulations. I got to thank you. I got to hope that article makes it out. <laughs> so <laughs> I don't want to jinx it. So, uh, but we haven't hit this. So it's a 2.99, 29.99 today. So everybody, yeah. there we go. Have a great night, everybody. We'll see everybody next week. See you guys. <laughs>